I'm here. Welcome, everyone. Enter strangers. Spell casting. D E E P E S T L O E R. It's the deepest law, but unfortunately, Horus, you didn't pick up the apple on stage two, so you have failed the quest. Don. <laughs> Nasty. <laughs> How are you doing, Laura? Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm, it's good to get killed as soon as I start the stream, but uh, that is about as harsh as Nightmare is. So I, I was watching, uh, I, I just watched, just, just before we came on air, I started watching uh, Series 2, and the first team were just like gone in 10 minutes, just like, yeah, bye, <laughs> bye. <laughs> new season started. We, let's kill off the new team straight away. Um, think, just the, before the, we... There's we a get lot to going. say about the deaths. Sorry, I just think a lot of what we'll talk about is the deaths, and you know the, that, that's the major theme: people getting killed. Oh, oh, absolutely! It's um, nightmare is quite a quite an amazing thing, um, and in fact, uh, as we'll get into, um, quite a major part of my childhood that I'd you know I kind of locked away in there. But when I started watching it again, it all started coming back to like. Just how much centrality and importance I gave it when I was growing up as well, but um, we will um, we'll get into that in a second. I'll just mention a couple of things at the start. Um, there's an extra show on AA Gold tonight because Red Hawk, the notorious um, plate spinner, um, has got some objections to the Women's Hour review of his uh, of his article that happened last week. So he will be um, he will be on a on a bonus stream later on on AA Gold to um, critique the critiquers, as it were, or to review the reviewers. Um, and he's got like insane notes. He's got an eighteen point rebuttal that he wants to uh, that he wants to share. So that will be interesting. I will also mention uh, if you haven't joined the channel, buy a mug, um, subscribe to my Substack. There was actually a free article uh, just this weekend gone, um, and um, most importantly, buy a course. That is the main way of uh, of keeping us uh, in business. Um, if you if you buy a course, uh, you will get uh, many hours of learning in return. I recommend the Trivium or Foundations of Politics or any of the other courses. Um, so with all of that out of the way, oh Horace, is there anything you'd like to show, sir, before we continue? I was just wondering when is Foundations of Dungeoneering coming out? Is that a while yet? <laughs> <don't know> <laughs> uh, I mean, I did. I I do have a friend called Morcar. And um, I noticed that there's a, like a there's like a, a side character in Nightmare who looks quite a lot like Morcar. Um, did you see him? Uh, let's have a pull up this. Uh... Does Morcar look like Lord, Lord Fear or what? No, no, no. Um, let me just show you. Hold on. Uh, characters, opposition. No, no, he become he becomes a good guy. He right. I'll show you now. Okay. Um, so this is. This is the character I have in mind. What's his name again? Um, this this guy on the left. Uh, Hodris. Hodr yeah, Hodris the Confuser. There he is there. Looks a <laughs> lot like uh, Morkar from Hero Quest. Ah, uh, from Hero Quest. Yeah, so if you have a look at Morkar from Hero Quest, uh, oh, let's, have, let's go for Evil Wizard. That's probably that's the, the right thing if you have a look at um the evil wizard from hero quest that look it's the same guy look okay yeah 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 yeah, it's I'm wondering, very... yeah was, was which one is older was nightmare or I, i'm guessing hero quest might be a little i mean older. hero quest was right around the same time i mean hmm. nightmare came out in 1987 yeah and hero quest came out in 
Oh, same year, was it? Wow. Well, a bounty. No, 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 1989. 1989. Uh, so, wow. So maybe the designers of Hero Quest watched Nightmare and got the design from Morkar from uh, Modric the Confuser. Well, 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 no, no, you mean Hordris the Confuser. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Modric was quite scary. Um, but it, yes. it was, yeah. I mean, was Hero Quest, because that was a Games Workshop thing, right? Was yeah, Hero Quest was Games Workshop, yeah. And Games Workshop was, was founded by Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson, who made the Fighting Fantasy series as well, right? Uh, the books. That's, that's right. No, yeah, I, and, I, sorry, go on. Carry on, Horace. Scott. Sorry. I think there's a slight delay. Sorry, I don't mean to talk over you. Um, there's, well, um, yeah, I, Games Workshop, I, th I believe, created Hero Quest. Uh, well, they certainly did advanced Hero Quest. Maybe, yeah, Hero Quest original might have actually not been them. I'm not sure. But I, yeah, it looks like they've ripped off from Hordris anyway. <laughs> but, I, I, uh, I only went into a, into a Games Workshop once ever, right? Please. And um, this true. was about yeah. in. That's not true. This was about in 1998, something like that. You and, only went um, in there once as a customer after having worked there for four years, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I went in there looking for Hero Quest stuff because my friend and I, like, we did like a, a Hero Quest renaissance in like 1997, 1998 sort of time. Um, I was just into the game. I came back and found all my friends painting the figures. I was disgusted. I was like... <laughs> What, what's all this painting things? I'm just in it for the dice and the, the quests and things. But um, but, but anyway, we went looking for extra expansions and things of Hero Quest, and I went to Games Workshop, and um, I walked in. I said, "Have you got any Hero Quest stuff?" And they just literally laughed. They laughed in my face, and then I left what? again. So, what? yeah, I'm, because I'm, okay, sorry, go on. I think Hero Quest was just done by the mid '90s. It was just like a long gone thing. So they just, you know. I, I yeah. was a Warhammerer, um, but I, we had Hero Quest at home first. I think we, we got it as like a collective present um, for Christmas, and we really enjoyed that. It was a really, really good board game. And then um, I got into Warhammer because my older brother was into it, and so I spent a lot of time in games workshops. I was one of those kids who was like in there for a whole day. You know, it was like a day out to a shop. <laughs> and, um, and they sold when I used to go in there, which would have been, I'm thinking from about, 92 to 95 or 6 maybe quite a long time I probably spent quite a lot of money on it uh for a kid anyway um but yeah they used to have advanced hero quest that was made and there was also space hulk which was mm -hmm. somewhat similar there was another one as well there was another space equivalent of hero quest as well but they had advanced hero quest that was made by games workshop i guess because it was a lot more like rpg playing and the yeah i mean the two guys who founded games workshop were like they were steeped in rpg so I was going to talk about this actually because I was thinking about like what was the thing that got me into kind of fantasy stuff as a kid, and um, honestly, it was probably this show. It was probably Nightmare that got me into the whole idea of you know dungeons and a dungeon master and um, just the idea of this kind of quasi medieval kind of fantasy world. Um, set in a kind of um you know in a, in, a, in a game setting and from there um there was also the dungeons and dragons cartoon you know the little with yeah. the little gnomey games master guy in it mm. if you remember that i don't Loved know if you remember it. that yeah. Yeah. um so th so there was that show and then and then hero quest coming out uh was major i was into hero quest as well and i think that was the gateway into um a lot of other things you know like uh then uh you know it would be like computer rpg games um in the 90s i, I had a game called uh let me think of um there was one called um return to crondor or betrayal at crondor that was one i i had there was one um called uh obviously Baldur's gate came out in 1998 wow um there were, I mean, there were ones that people have forgotten about for like, for like for the Amiga and things that had like maps and, you know, you'd get the game and it came with a bunch of extra stuff, yeah. like a, like a, like a, like a, like a booklet, probably as thick as the Bible, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And so the book contains were, a lot of lore as well. There'd be like mini yeah, stories. All over the lore and then like the original, um, you know, like Daggerfall. Uh, I'm just mm. talking like in the 
you know what RPGs were like in the nineties on on computer games. Um, but then, of course, like if you were to stick with board gaming, um, you'd probably advance from Hero Quest to advanced Hero Quest, and then finally play D and D or something like that. Yeah. Um, if you got that far, or you'd go into like Warhammer or, or some of the other games that you mentioned there. Um, but uh, it, pr- it was probably Nightmare that was the gateway for. I mean, not if if it was a gateway for me, it was probably the gateway for millions of kids in the UK. So we should probably explain what was Nightmare to anybody who's either too young or foreign, or like what, if you could explain to the audience what in the what on earth was Nightmare. Well, obviously it was a it was a it was a children's it was it was aimed at children. I think from any age up to maybe sixteen, probably wasn't of much interest to those older, but. Um, well, the contestants seem to go up to about 16, I think, um, and as young as maybe 11, uh, 11 or 12. There's quite a big difference between between those age ranges in terms of what they're capable of. And um, yeah, it was it was uh, the, the main the, the dungeoneer was the kid who would put on the helmet of justice, which blinded them apart from what was directly you know could see directly below them, and uh, they would be guided through the dungeon um, by their three helpers who could see and who between them could help solve i mean the kid you know the dungeoneer was uh, you know able to join in the, the riddles and stuff in the first couple of series one of the main challenges you'd, you'd encounter again and again was you'd enter a room that was apparently plain and then one of the walls would come alive and they you know it'd be called a wall monster but yeah granitas was one of the first ones granitas <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I was granitas i was gonna play <laughs> I was going to play some clips for us as well. To um, mm. to I, I I both of the clips I've got lined up are from series one, just to um, just to give a flavour of what it was like. But uh, continue. I'll play them in. I'll, I'll play them in a moment. Um, yeah, well, just, uh, I, yeah. I, I think most fans of this program would agree that series one and two were the best. Um, there was things to complain about in all of the other series, but it was still good enough that I watched it all the way to the point when it was cancelled, which was after season eight. Um, but it was re- like, I mean, it had a wow factor for the, the late eighties, especially. It was really advanced, like visual technology um, for the time. Uh, it obviously looks, you know probably quite dated now but there was some real artistry to it as well the, the guy who uh, was like the main art designer for the backgrounds uh, was seems to have been much admired and like did a really good job and created well yeah, the first they were hand painted weren't they they were hand painted yeah. in the series one and two which i had no idea until just today i was just reading about it but yeah it was hand painted by i think it's called mark howe or something um yeah and like yeah it was very much admired by everyone else who worked on it and um yeah it was it was well, I think the, the best thing about the first few seasons, especially, is it had a real sense of constant danger and sort of trapped. You know, you just need to keep moving onwards into ever greater danger. You can't you can't slow down. There's lots of different devices in this program to make you hurry up. And uh, yeah, and, and like you've got Treyguard, who's the dungeon master. Uh, in the law, he completed the dungeon. He was the first person ever to complete the dungeon. That's how he became the dungeon master. Oh, I didn't uh, know he, that. And he did it alone. <laughs> Yeah, in the in the in the nightmare book, there's there's actually four nightmare books, and in the first, well, in each one, there's like a novel and then a game, like a choose your own adventure, fighting fantasy sort of game, and in the first one, it's him completing the dungeon uh, with no help, but he, he also he can see. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, they yeah, in, especially in the first few seasons, he he's sort of your friend. He helps you at certain points, but he also laughs when you get killed. Which is absolutely. Yeah, I mean, th- this is. I mean, this is like perfect uh, dungeon <laughs> mastering in my mind. Like he's yeah. like, okay, I'll guide you, but also, I mean, I mean, one of the things that struck me watching it, Horus, was just like how how uh, he chastised the team as well. Hurry up, team! Yes. Hurry up! And... You've already been given the clue. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. which is great like i mean yeah i can totally understand why the producer would want that as well it's just to, to move it along so it's never like just a plain you know nothing happening bit um but also he admonishes them when they get killed as well he's like you knew that you needed gold to bribe your way through <laughs> and then they don't get to reply and he just dismisses them and that's it on to the next thing 
I love that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we should explain, I, I've been seeing some people in the chat describe it as the as the dark souls of the 80s. And what, one of the reasons is because it's so fucking hard. <laughs> it is punishing. I, I, I watched all of C, uh, series one, just uh, prep, prepping with a show, expecting at least one of the teams to win. It doesn't. No. They get to. No. I thought the last team. I was like, oh, they've saved the winning team for the finale, and then the winning, and then the, this last team who've been going for a couple of episodes. They just walk into a room and they're just like, yeah, there's a bomb. The bomb's gone off. You're dead. <laughs> and he, and the Trey Gar's like, ah, oh, you walked into the wrong door, stupid team. <laughs> good, goodbye. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's amazing. It's so good. Uh, yeah. Let me just let me just play some of it to give a flavour. For those who've never seen Nightmare before, um, not that I imagine anybody who's watching this has never seen it, but let's uh, let's have a little watch. Hold on. Oh, and uh, the one thing I the one thing I'll say going into this as well, um, title music is awesome. The theme tune is just so cool. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated watching it back as an adult is just how straight it was played. I was like, like if you were about. I don't know, eight or nine watching this, genuinely quite scary. You know, like there's no hint that Traegar is messing around at all. Like he's just he plays it dead straight in these early in these early seasons. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. He he adds to the menace and the thrill of it. It's brilliant. Let, let's uh, let's have a little watch. <laughs> Welcome, Watchers of Illusion, uh, to the Castle of Confusion. Phase with us now for we, this. We, we've got the bloody, uh, we've, we've got the bloody dreaded uh, low frame rate. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, some sometimes happens here in the lodge with the um, with the Wi-Fi connection. Sorry about that. But let, let's watch a bit more. You can get the voice at least. This is the time of adventure. I, Treyguard, issue the challenge. Beyond that portal lies the Dungeon of Deceit, which I alone have mastered. But those of you who cross the boundaries of time must master it also. The first is now without, so enter, stranger. Who challenges my dungeon? David Campbell. You have some small previous experience of dungeoneering, I hope. Yes, I have. Very well. <laughs> That's another aspect of this I love, by the way. It's the uh, is the actual kids themselves. They were just like, <laughs> "Hey, I'm David from Norwich." You know, <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. <laughs> well, and what reward do you seek here? I seek knighthood. That will not be possible. Only the first step. Tonight, straight away, slap down. You can't have a knighthood, mate. Get out of it. It can be taken here. Squiredom is the reward for surviving the dungeon, for silver precedes gold. And the silver spurs of a squire will be yours if you survive. Now you know you may have three advisors to aid you on your quest. Call them to us, please. David, James, Lucien, come. Where? Yeah. Well, I can't say I'm over impressed, but then appear. <laughs> I just love the fact this kid on the right, he's got his, <laughs> he's got his like, um, you know, stoned out blue jeans right up to his, right up to his belly button in the eighties manner. It's awesome. Appearances, <laughs> as we know, are so often deceptive. Who guides this dungeoneer? I'm David Hemp from Cranfield in Bedfordshire. <laughs> James Hoggett from Wooten, Bedfordshire. Lucian Morris from Cranfield, Bedfordshire. Well, I'm sure you'll do. And if you don't, someone will find the results amusing. Now, two matters of the most serious. David, 
Your quest through the dungeon is for truth and justice. The justice, of course, is blind. And when you don this helmet, you also become blind. Although you'll find there's just enough vision to examine and collect objects. Just a quick question, Horace. Would you have preferred to be the dungeoneer or, or in the studio? What, would you, what role would you prefer to take? Um, in well, I applied to go on the show and I was going to be the dungeoneer. But the reason for it was that I, uh, the, the other three kids that I was going to be on with were all in the top set in school for everything. And I was only in the top set for most things. So they needed the, we needed the cleverest ones behind the behind the camera. Can, can, can I just say as well, when you were watching through, did you get all of the riddles correct? Because I didn't. Not all. I was no, just like no, no. fucking hell. These no. are hard. Yeah. Like not just like they're hard for adults, not just hard for kids. What's really good it's is so... some of some of the kids get some of the hard questions as well. They know a lot about uh, mythology and stuff because in the, at least in the first few seasons, all the questions are like mythology some nature stuff like plants animals and that and they they do pretty well um for little kids uh yeah but there's one question where it's like what uh, the, the answer is saladin and i would i never had any idea who yeah, saladin I, was, uh, I, was in my 20s, I, so. I was screwed up by that i uh, i was watching with mrs aa i was like what is it mohammed is it i mean saladin <laughs> saladin but i only i only knew i i literally only knew that because of civilization i'll be honest Sid Meier's civilization had. Right, right, right. One of them has got Saladin as a leader. So yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that was Sid Four. Um, one of the um, one of the questions that caught me out from uh, Gravitas was when he's talked about like, oh, where in this land is the long, like, what is the, you know, and what caught me out is that he was talking about like this land is in Britain, and I thought, well. You know, here in this realm or something, and I thought he meant the world within Nightmare, so I yeah. didn't get that one. But um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the one question that I didn't get was they they asked like what what were bows usually made of? What tree? Do you know? Would you know that? Oh God, a birch. The, the I have no idea. The ideal tree, maybe it's like English or Welsh bowman. I don't know, but yeah, the the answer was a yew tree. I never knew that. <laughs> no, I didn't know that either. Hmm. Um, but how these how these kids knew it, I, I'll never know. I mean, they got it right as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one of the things is that I had the other assumption I had uh, coming into this was that it, it's hard, but it's like unfair hard, i.e., it's just luck. But w one of the things I realized watching back through is actually, if you got all of the questions right, you could actually increase your. Like, I don't know, if you get all three Gravitas questions right, he'll basically tell you which object you need to pick up later on That's rather right. than it just being a guess. So yeah, it's not actually clear whether some of the deaths are as unfair as they appear because if you'd if you'd kind of 100%ed it, you could actually get through. Um, although it also seemed to me that some teams got a harder run through than others. Like... They they definitely did. We should we should discuss this. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're going to carry on playing the clip, but that, this is quite a major thing. Like they, it was unfair. It was not yeah, just I mean, harsh. I, it was also unfair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one. I, I'll give you an example. That team that I thought was going to win at the end of series one, um, they uh, you know they they're going through and they reach um, they reach that uh, monk. You know the the end of level two boss or whatever he is called, or is the end of, he's the end of level one boss right before the the monk sitting by the well i forget his oh, name cedric yes yeah, cedric it's... the monk right yeah and um they're about to do his three questions and you know most teams going through like we were saying would need to 100 percent those three questions and the questions are fucking hard like, <laughs> like and he says as part of his spiel like you know if um if you if you answer all three questions correctly i'll become your servant but like fat chance of that happening basically nobody ever does it but on this occasion um folly the jester turns up and he's like challenges him to an insult duel you know, right. monkey island style and <laughs> um it defeats him in the insult duel and therefore like wins on behalf of the contestants i was like well none of the other teams got that so it was yeah like i the mean was, was that to give them a leg up you know yeah was that due to something they did with folly a few screens before or was that just good luck I, I I don't know I don't know I I didn't I didn't see anything in particular that special yeah. that they did to get folly to. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, there's there's many instances you could cite that are like that where 
uh, it's the, yeah, there's just like, other teams did the same and did and got worse luck or better luck. Uh, that happens because in the books, it's quite specific that if you have no other clue of which way to go and you're presented with two or more exits, you always take the right. The right is the side of good, the left is the side of darkness and evil, right? Uh, in the program, that is applied occasionally <laughs> and yeah. arbitrarily, and just every now and then someone dies just for going left when, when others didn't. That's just completely unfair. But <laughs> yeah, but the, I mean, I mean one know. one of the one of the teams. The, in fact, I think it was this same team because one of the things I noticed about this team is they they bickered a lot. The the the, the three kids in the studio. This mm -hmm. is the team that gets really far in series one at the end, but then like dies to the bomb room. Right? They, they ended up go they end up going left when they should have gone right. Um, but one of the things that team does all the way through is they check the objects for clues. They're like, oh, well, is there anything on the, is there anything on it? Like the bar of gold's got a crown on it, you know, little things like that. Where it's like, you know, there are, there is a lot of obscurity in the quest. Um, yeah. Where it's like, you know, there could be tiny, tiny little, little indicators of what to do. But at the end of the day, how the hell would they, you know, there's something they missed that would have told them to go right. I, I actually think it's because they they got the third Merlin question wrong on that quest. Because um, Merlin Merlin gives them one spell, even though they got two they got two correct. I reckon if they got three right, he would have, he would have said, yeah. By the way, in a couple of rooms down, go right rather than left or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think that is the case. There's at least one time though when I noticed that they got killed and. It was just luck. There was no way they there was no clue as to what to take. And it wasn't there was no questions. There was just, you know, there was just clues and you just had to choose them. There was no wall monster or Merlin or Motley or Folly or anything. And they just they just chose wrong. And Tragod tells them, Oh, what did you bring the horn for? That's no good to you. Oh uh, well, it's yes. too late now. <laughs> but they didn't know. <laughs> but yes. apparently I was reading today on nightmare.com, which is quite a good, quite a good website. Um, that apparently the producers sometimes decided that a team was boring and just gave them bad luck. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> like the, um, the people, like the, I think the producer himself said that. Like, we, 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 sorry, we had to create good entertainment. It's not just. It's not just about fairness. Well, and <laughs> I watched. I watched that one with the Jericho earlier on, and um, mm. they they have a choice between a dagger and a horn. And Traegar just says something like, why did you bring a dagger when you're a blind man? You know, a weapon that you yeah. cannot yield, you're dead. Um, you know, it's just like... <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> again, maybe Merlin would have told them, I don't know. In the book, it does it does give you some sort of indication, like offense will always serve you better than... De you know, defense will always serve you better than offense because, yeah, because you're blind and things like this. Yeah. So, But in the TV thing. show, you get no guidance like that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So let's uh, let's watch a little bit more. I just want to get them into the dungeon so that people can see what it looks like if they've never seen the show. Objects from directly beneath. The others remain here, where with magic they can be your eyes. Their voices will reach you through the helmet. Now the dungeon ahead is an alien place, and so to sustain your progress, a sprite of energy will travel with you. Oh yeah, here this we go is its manifestation now this imagine you're like eight seven eight years old watching this as we would have been <laughs> it's actually quite like do you think they show this to kids today or do they think they consider it like inappropriate for children or something i think um, loads of things about nightmare would be considered like yeah too too nasty too death related there's also like a lot of the sort of adult actors like they manhandle the children and stuff that's probably yeah. ruled out now and things like that so yeah, or they insult them, you know. Um, well, they make as if to hit them, but then obviously, like, it's kind of covered up. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> like one one so kid gets hit with a staff on the head and, and stuff like that. <laughs> if people haven't seen this, it turns into a this slowly the flesh comes off and it turns into a skull, and it shows the life force. Warning team, life force dangerously low. And the last thing. It is your own life force. So, God, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. I, was gonna, I was just going to say, the, the, you know, the last thing you see if you're about to die is there's just parts of the skull coming apart and flying off. And there's just two eyeballs left and then they fly off. And it's just like, 
sort of visceral. Yeah, and then, you know? and then a, do- a gong. Gong. <laughs> so I love dark. the gong. I love the gong. <laughs> <laughs> and must be fed with food, which you will find occasionally on your quest. This oh. is condition green. On condition red, you are in great peril. For this is no game for a player with numerous lives. And when this one's done, your adventure is over. Yeah, no second chances. It's so unforgiving. Yeah. yeah. To feed your life force, you must place any food in this knapsack. But place only food there for any other objects. The other thing I noticed is that the timing on the life force draining seems to be very inconsistent. Is there, when they're interacting with a character, it, I assume that's put into a free state and that it's only, life force only drains when you're like in kind of, I don't know, like out of an encounter type thing. Because it entirely, seems to be like. It's entirely decided by the producer, I think. It's um, like as they go along, it's just to hurry you up. That's all it is. Just It's just for the, to speed up no, the entertainment. Because, um, to, yeah. It was added in post-production. The the graphics were actually added in post-production. So they're never, you know, when they say, oh, quick, like, you know, you've got to get that that pie in the knapsack before the eyeball flies away. But no, 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 that that was all added in. (laughs) (laughs) One of the things I remember, um, I didn't manage to watch the later seasons um, for this. I only watched out one and two. But uh, I seem to remember as a kid, that there would be goblins chasing them, like with a horn. That's right. Goblins are coming. Right. Yeah. When when were they brought in? Probably season two. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, if they're not in the first season, I'm sure they're in the second. Yeah, yeah. And again, yeah. that was a hurry up thing. They they hardly ever got killed by the goblins. But yeah, bro, what was the? Bro, bro, bro. Yeah, that was it. That was um, by it, the way, yeah. you, you, you played Civilization Four, did you? Or... Yeah, well, I played all of them from one right. all the way to six. Yeah. Same Eric said I haven't played six, but um, in 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 Civ Four when you declared war, there'd be um, a horn go off, right? And it'd be like, bah, 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 bah. do you remember that? Yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah. like to me that's the, that sounds like the same horn. I think I actually think yeah. Sid, Sid Meier was watching Nightmare. <laughs> maybe <laughs> like, maybe Nightmare just uh, influenced all the games and things. Uh, they were all watching the same as us, and then if they, I mean, if they of... copied Hordris, they would copy everything else. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm I'm convinced that the Hordris and Morkar designs are too similar to not be a coincidence. I um, think so. Also be consumed. You will, of course, find other objects on your quest. Choose them and use them with care. And remember, you may carry only two at a time. Now, I am constrained to offer you certain final warnings, so listen to my words very carefully. On your quest, I shall be with you. And yet, not with you. For there are places in the dungeon where even I may not safely go. The way to truth. I, I quite like that dynamic, by the way, that there are certain characters who kind of keep Traeguard at bay. One of them is Lilith, who we'll see in a second. But uh, I kind of like that mechanism where he's, he's kind of warded powerful. off by... Yeah. Because yeah. he appears in a little a loot, like a, in, a, in a corner of the room, doesn't he, occasionally? Um, that's right is tortuous there is no correct route through the dungeon but the right path can be found using logic and guile the only way is onward there is no turning back I'll just say that when we were watching it when I was watching with Mrs. AA she kept on saying god is he going to stop interrupting them because he comes in every like five like he comes in quite a lot with quite lengthy spiels um what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> he, he he really dominates the whole thing. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, I mean, maybe you could you could put it on like one point five speed or something because it actually talks quite slowly, doesn't it? Because um, I found that like um, the pace the pace of the pro- they actually waste quite a lot of time, which was one thing that was always yeah. annoying about it. Um, they actually, I mean, the first couple of series it, it was it was good, but they, they yeah they found more ways to waste that. I don't know why. I don't know what that added into it. But they yeah, when they brought in like p- pickle pickles and pickle. there was loads of like weird little interactions and things <laughs> that slowed that slowed things down even more. Um, yeah. I will say though that I think Tregar is the thing that holds everything together. The show wouldn't work without him. 
really, he's would the, it? He's the beating heart of it. And he, he, like one of his main functions, as I said before, is just to to get rid of teams quickly without them getting a word in and stuff. That's like, <laughs> even when they win, they, they, there's like one minute of celebration. They just get given some sort of. It's just a trinket. It's like you don't even see it, yeah. and then it's just right off with you. Next team. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an amazingly kind of unforgiving circular world where it's just like a never ending rotation of dungeoneers coming through enter stranger it's like yeah. uh, time is cyclical in the world of nightmare you know and but... when they bring when they bring lord fear in i think in season five um it becomes more obvious or more more explicit that it's actually a game between trey guard and lord fear there's the powers that be versus the opposition and the kids are just being thrown <laughs> they're just like gi's being thrown into like as cannon fodder to uh to they're now, just being run you... out of lord fear did you did you get I've got one of my longest lasting memories of Nightmare as a kid was this team who actually reached Lord Fear. They actually, they actually got to him at the end. And I, I mean one of the things we should say, I don't know how many teams ever won, but it wasn't many. Like there are whole like season one I saw had no winners. Yeah. Season two, I think, has got one or two. It's got two winners, yeah. Season three has no winners at all. That's right. Um, and then season four, there was at least one winner. Uh, and then season yeah. five, I think there was one. Yeah, overall, there was eight winners across the eight seasons. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, it's punishingly difficult. I, yeah. I, I don't know how many teams there were overall. And like, some of those were given a break. Some of those were given shortcuts and good luck and stuff as well. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's a very difficult game. Very few people ever won it. Um, also, it seems like the dungeon changes ever so slightly from quest to quest as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For each it's team, not, yeah. yeah it, it's not always the same. You, 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 there's a lot of similar rooms, but how they're joined up, you know, seems to be uh, more discretionary, let's just say. Um, but my abiding memory is that there's a team who actually reached Lord Fear. That they reached his chamber and he was there. But they, you know, they forgot to pick up the mirror shield or whatever it was, and he just zapped them. <laughs> he just sat them and that was it. Um, and he did it really nonchalantly as well. And it's just, just like laser finger and there, there it was. Um, so I don't know if that's like a, a Mandela effect, like imagined memory or if it actually happened, but it stayed with me for many, many years. So I, um, I tried to watch all eight seasons in preparation for this, but I just did not have enough time. I, got, I think I got through the first five seasons. What you said, I mean, Lord Fear only comes in in season five, I think. So what you said probably happens in the remaining three. But I think I remember that, especially when you described how he just sort of like, lang yeah, just lazily just kind of zaps him. That really yeah, strong like he's gonna lean, Like he's going to lie lying down almost. Um, <laughs> yeah, amazing. Amazing. Um, there's so one time, I, there's, there's one occasion when Lilith kills them and they just they just didn't bring a bribe for. Oh, no, she got a headache. And they yeah, just I've got, I, I've, I've actually got that clip lined up because it was, it was an example of just how punishingly fucking difficult it was. I'm sure I'm actually with that one, to talk there was about... no way, there was no way they could know she had a headache. They, the, the natural thing <laughs> would be to bring her a bribe, but this time she's got a headache and she doesn't want gold. She's like, I've got loads of gold. <laughs> yeah, it's like they had a choice of pills or gold, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we'll take the gold. Oh, Not oh shit, time. she wanted, she wanted headache pills, you know. Um, <laughs> Let, let's get them into the dungeon and I'll play a bit of Lilith because I don't know about you, but I think in the first two seasons, at least, the second strongest performance is Lilith. She's a very yeah. strong character, in my opinion. Mm. What, what do you think, Horus? Um, yeah, I think she's all right. I mean, yeah, I think all of the the supporting actors, are pre they're like pantomime actors. They're like, um, I've looked up a bunch of them. They're all complete nobodies except... One or two of them. I think Pickle was in a few other things. He was in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, apparently. And also Alec Westwood, who plays Folly, was in Game of Thrones much later, but not much was else. He? Apparently, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what role. I haven't really watched Game of Thrones. I, myself, I kind but. of like how Shakespearean Folly is as a as a as a yeah. as a fool. You know, he's very uh but again, it's dark for kids, you know. He's like a dark mm. fool, you know. It's not yeah, it's weird. He's kind of mad, and he's kind of yeah. He's like it's a bit unreal, and yeah, it's <laughs> it is. It does add to the darkness, even though he's supposed to be a jester. It is still quite sinister, isn't it? Yeah, I I, I know they replaced him with a. Is it Motley the fool afterwards? Mm. Yeah, he's a little bit. He's a little bit more prancy and light-hearted, I think, mm. than than than. than 
um, than Folly was. Uh, he's a little bit be. more. Um, he's a bit, little bit more lubricious as well. He makes like funny comments about the women and stuff like that, which is quite funny. <laughs> but Folly seems more unreal. Folly's got this kind of cool makeup, and he's just he's more like a sort of alien or uh, not an alien, like a sort of semi-real character. It's just quite cool. Yeah, I'll see if I can find some Folly in a, in a second. But let's get them into the dungeon, and then I'll I'll play some Lil Lilith, and then I'll see if I can find some Folly. Hold on. Well, David. Do you still wish to enter the quest? Yes, I do. <laughs> Very well. Turn then. Face the door and take a step forward. Have you noticed, by the way, that some of the kids laugh at all of Traegar's jokes and things and other ones just stony-faced? I imagine David wouldn't laugh at any of the jokes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? You're in a reasonably large room. Ahead of you, on the wall, there are two doors with portcullises in them. To your right and left, diagonally, there are also two portcullises, two exits. Did you think girls watch this show? Because girls occasionally were on the teams, but this seems like such a boy show to me. Or I would say uh, so. But there was there was plenty of girl contestants, but I remember my older sister liked it. She's like quite a bit older than me and she 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 really liked it so yeah there, there, there's loads of girl contestants like about 30 or 40 percent of the teams i think yeah because there's there's a lot of there's a lot, lot of character stuff i suppose that a girl, a girl I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but I've lost you. Oh, well, I mean, even though uh, AA, sorry to interrupt, but there's a lot of people saying robot in the chat, and I can hear you really badly roboting. So I don't know if you can hear me. They're saying spell casting T O B O R. Does that work? No, it doesn't. Because <laughs> I'm not a real dungeoneer. I'm not able to cast spells or dispel them. Uh, oh dear. Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, um I, I i don't know if you can hear me but oh you've left oh <laughs> i'm on my own in the dungeon facing lord fear or i oh, know he doesn't really exist does he i'm not really in the dungeon uh you can all hear me can you that's good well i'll, I'll try and sustain the stream i hope I, I tell a joke says r bill arbly okay um why did the girl fall off the swing because she had no arms. <laughs> uh, spell casting. A R M S. Nope, she still hasn't got any arms. <laughs> Gutted. <laughs> I never thought I'd be hosting a stream with such a huge audience. Look at the speed of the chat. It's amazing. Oh, look, yeah, I got a laugh there from Essex. Oh, yeah, yeah, people like that one. That was good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, so if I uh, go through the left door, says stand one no if i do that i'll get killed so uh, that was bad advice i think deliberately i suspect um yeah um so um yeah so i was going to be the one in the helmet um because everyone else you know, my team was in set one for everything in school but i was in set one for everything except science uh because i think there were just too many people in set one i was actually all right at science so uh that was um that was unfair but all the same that was the criteria by which it was decided i would be in the helm the helm of justice um did it if anyone else watched it did you think that the lady who was supposed to be like the guardian of the forest was quite beautiful do, do you know who i mean um <laughs> history bro says tell us about the maisky diaries while you're here well yeah aa hey, hey. Um, everyone, everyone, subscribe to History Bros channel. You'll see it there in the chat. Uh, click on History Bros. He's got a terrific channel. I've been on some of his early videos, actually. Uh, the ones about Mao Tse Tung. Um, 
some of the first videos on his channel. But uh, yeah, about the Matrix Diaries, that is a video on my channel. If anybody wants to see how I got famous, uh, you go to, go look at my channel on Odyssey. I got banned off YouTube for uh, unfair reasons. <clears throat> but on on my Odyssey on my Odyssey channel, you can see videos called the Matrix Diaries and, and others, which you might like. Why the name Horus, says Tom Ricketts. Look, what, sorry, what has this got to do with Nightmare? I should be talking about Nightmare, shouldn't I? Um, why the name Horus? Just because when I was a kid, I thought that Horus, the Egyptian god Horus, was really cool uh, in the way that he <clears throat> he got like he got destroyed and taken to pieces, and all the pieces of him were scattered all over the all over Egypt, and he he had to reconstitute himself from the spirit world or something like that. I just thought that was quite a majestic story well, that might have been his father uh that might have been his father osiris that he had to reconstitute i can't remember now uh and his mother was isis wasn't it <laughs> um but yeah i also had a game called eye of horus uh computer game it wasn't very good but it, it stayed with me and that was where i sort of learned about the myth were horus and sargon contemporaries <laughs> what sargon of akkad I doubt it. I reckon Horus would be further back. I, I don't know how far back the Akkadians go, but uh, talk about myself, Horus says he is the eunuch. Um, okay, I am doing that. I try not to because it sounds. Oh, sorry, yeah, Horace, I, I am now. I am now back. back. I don't. I don't know what happened. My it was like the internet just cut out, froze. I had to reset um, everything. It works again. So yeah, well, uh, Lilith. No, Hordris was pissed off that you thought Lilith was a better character. So. Oh, was it? Well, to be in fairness, I haven't got up to Hordris in. I think he comes in in series three, I think. Yeah. Um, but I, I was just going to. I was just saying before uh, before I cut out that I think there was enough. Even though it's an adventure thing, it's quite character driven, and there's a lot of like. I think there are a lot of elements girls could get into as well yeah. as boys. Um, yeah. Now that I think about it, so probably. Well, and it wasn't yeah. uncommon when, when uh, in our age for girls to be into fantasy stuff. That wasn't that strange. Like they would like, you know, so it was way more boys, but you would still, if you went to a, a medieval reenactment day or something, you'd see plenty of girls there as well. It'd be, you know, things like that. So yeah, the, the sex lines I mean, became more clearly divided. I mean, in my experience, like even um, girls can even play uh, RPG games as well. Like, yeah. like board, board RPG games. They tend, I mean, without wishing to stereotype, they tend to be more into um, character interactions than into min maxing their character sheet. If that makes any sense, <laughs> like <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, so, anyway, um, let us uh, let us carry on watching a uh, watching a bit more. Um, I, I was thinking, by the way, that um, you know. Uh, because I was talking, uh, you know, uh, getting into getting into the difference between fantasy and sci-fi, and whether there's something about fantasy that plays into personality types more, or sci-fi that plays into personality types more. Um, and um, I was thinking about it, like what, like what is sort sort of stuff have I been into usually? And I, I've I've definitely tended more towards medieval fantasy stuff than sci-fi stuff for for one reason or another uh, apart from star wars but then i thought well star wars is pretty much like a fantasy just that happens to be set in space it's just like it's not really a sci-fi um any thoughts on that before we carry on like the fantasy sci-fi thing um i like both i i do see star wars as kind of, well, yeah I, I see I, I know it's supposed to be set a long time ago but it, i do still see it as sci-fi um but yeah, I, I like I actually like both. I played both the Warhammers, which most people most people get tribal about one or the other. But I played <laughs> I played fantasy and forty k. Um, yeah, I like both. Let's carry on. And a port policy in front of each of them. On the floor, there are four letters. These are N, P, O, and E. The nearest one to you is E. Open. They say ah, they spell open. Not too taxing to start off with. <laughs> You're wasting energy, team. There's small chance of success if you allow this simple puzzle to right. draw you. Sorry, well. Get on with it. It's too easy. Oh. Well, take the right steps for further right. progress. Turn right slightly. <laughs> he literally won't even give them like a minute to confer. It's just like, fucking get on with it. 
already. <laughs> <laughs> this is don't forget. This is the first ever, yeah. the first ever room that any team has ever been in, and he's just like, yeah, already get on with it. Are they about to spell open wrong though? They're heading for the P, aren't they? <laughs> well, let's have a look. Well, maybe they think it's P on. Could be P on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or nope. And turn left a bit. Forward until I say stop. I Remember stop. that which turn does not slightly. read right must be spelt correctly. And say open. Open. No, oh, <laughs> perhaps you can pick the letters up if you walk them or something. Here, yeah, John. <laughs> Um, can you turn left slightly? See if it has anything. Did, did, did the subsequent teams get to watch this, by the way? Because no, no other team got confused with this. They just did it immediately, so... I, I think this, they only do this this particular thing once. I think afterwards they make it, like, just quicker. Like, you just get the word <laughs> by stepping on one letter or something, you know. <laughs> it happens if it goes across. Okay. And work, uh, walk across the letter, if you can see it. Okay. Just yeah. walk straight no, forward. you can't it. see it. <laughs> turn right slightly. And walk course. straight forwards a few paces. What? 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 Right, so that's what obvious. Doing? It does nothing. Okay. Remember, Stop. spelt correctly. They should be oh, killed yeah. for this. All right. Turn round completely. A bit more. Oh, dear. Yeah, but I mean, if they killed him for this, that would be like the shortest go ever, like a little less than a minute, you know? Yeah. All right, walk forward until I say stop. 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 Oh, it's tedious. Turn right. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Walk forward a bit. They're not doing side steps either. Stop. Oh, Jesus God. Oh, Turn right, dear. Again. <laughs> right. Now walk forward one small pace. Right again. Hurry up, team. <laughs> walk forward another yeah. small pace. All right. You get the idea. You get the idea. I, I'm not watching them. Uh... This, so I, this I've got makes a... it look shit, though. I know. I, I've got a clip lined up for where they, um, where that Lilith gives them that extremely unfair death. I think it's the second team. So Just this for, team, for this free. team that we're watching now lose, and then this team with this girl come in, with this kind of Debbie Harry girl here on the left. Um, for anyone who's not seen Nightmare before, the first challenge is not always as boring. <laughs> it's like they they really made a meal of that. That's terrible. Mate. They know, yeah, they don't even learn to use the side steps until a few teams have gone by. So, yeah. Uh, rookie errors from that team there, but let's uh, let's see how they get on with Lilith now. Yeah. Should we take, go for the soap? Just take soap. the soap. Yeah, right. I'll pick it up now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just the soap. Right, right. right. Hurry, team. When oh, granite oh, no. sleep, turn to your turn right. Turn right. Turn Old right. Turn right. Awakens. Turn right. Choose wisely but swiftly now. Turn right again. Yes. yes. And again, yeah. Then forward. Go forward. forward. Try goes like I'm trying to tell you something. Can you shut right. up? Right. right. Turn right. right. Forward, Maybe that was forward. it. Maybe that was where he would have given them the clue as to yeah. what the fuck to pick up, you know. Yeah. Where am I? Don't go any further. Right. Stop there. Yeah. Um, it's a You're in a room that's changing. So it's, it's a chasm. It's, it's, yeah. There's a, a great big there's a, a drop at your feet. At my feet? At your yes. feet. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't move, at move at all. Right, shall I go back? Yes. No, one just, step. Just, one step back. back. That's it. Yeah, that's right. better. Yes. All right. Is she going to have to go through this wall here? There's the something wall. moving on opposite you. I mean, in front of me. Oh, yes. oh, God. How dare you! <laughs> Out at once, Lily does not receive unannounced visitors. And don't you know any better than to burst into a lady's chamber before she's even had time to do her hair? Apologize at once, rude girl. Apologize. Yes, yes, I can yes. see you spies. There's one thing worse than people who burst through one's doors. It's other people who peer through windows. <sighs> Listen, rude intruder. There is just some chance you may be able to do me some service. Do you have gifts? What precisely do you have? A block of soap. <laughs> a block of soap? <laughs> Kindly explain how I am to comb my hair with that. Oh, dragon's breath. I lose all patience with you. I will just have to throw you out. I have no time for those who bumble. So boulders crack and that ledge crumble. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to drop in. 
<laughs> so br- brutally unfair. Oh dear, what a pity. Never mind. Maeve appears to have suffered a fatal fall. I, I was reading on that nightmare.com that um, Lilith apparently racks up more kills than any other character, which I, I didn't realise. I think she, I, I don't know how many she gets in, in total, but that's what, that's the first one, you know. And I, I mean, this is just how dismissive, like, this is what happens when they die. Let's, let me just show you. What a shame you didn't take the comb when it was so obviously needed. Now your adventure is over. Bye. But I'm glad to say that's not the end of May. Look in your magic mirror and you'll see, see that they don't get to say anything. In the dungeon, she has survived in the reality you call your time. Time now for you to join her. Spell casting. D I S M I S. Dismissed. Farewell, the remorseless <laughs> tray guard. He's just there's no sorrow. He's 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 as happy to dismiss them as he is to congratulate yeah, them. Yeah. The, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is is his closing spiel, because at the end of every episode, um, they they he freezes time. Mm. Um, so here's the bomb. Like here's one of these bomb rooms that they go in. Hold on. Go forward. All right. Watch now. Okay. Now, where am I? You're in a room with a large bomb. <laughs> it's just the fuse is just lit. Go! So turn Fucking to move! Your left. Go! Go quickly forward. Oh, I know we're lucky there. Uh, Warning, team. Complete temporal disruption approaching. Time is now the enemy. Oh dear. Temporal disruption complete. Time flies, as the Romans would say. And although all continues in your world, here time has flown. All adventuring must now cease until you phase with us once more. Will our team triumph on the next level? Or will our dungeoneer come to a sticky end? And if so, why should you care? For here, nothing is real and everything must surely be an illusion. Join us again for Nightmare. And just keep telling yourself it's only a game, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, quite, that's quite extreme for a kid's show, you know. It, it wasn't just a game. I mean, if it was just a game, the, the rules would be more, uh, more clear and more consistently applied. It, it's, it's primarily entertainment. <laughs> but very, it was... It was it was the most enthralling thing when I was a child. I like from I wanted to be in front of the TV. I wasn't like this with anything else, but for this, I wanted. Oh, well, maybe Games Master a bit later, but I wanted. Yeah, I was to be into in Games a, Master as well. Yeah, that was very exciting. But I wanted to be in front of the TV as the credits started and all the way till the end of the end credits. Like it was, it was my absolute most exciting thing. And I remember yeah, one I mean, too because it was on Friday evenings. Um, I think well, it was always on Fridays. What, one so, of the things, um, one of the things that actually, I think the story that I told that got us into even doing this show, is that I, um, I used to set, up, I, I had things like judo and various like clubs I had to go to after school, um, so I'd leave my mother instructions for what to, what to record, and um, sometimes a show was so important I'd like, ask, I'd put a star next to it or underline it, you know, I'd be like, this is the really important one, and nightmare was like. I don't know how you, it was like S tier. It was like, you cannot under any circumstances miss this one. Um, you know, if you take nothing else, make sure you fucking get nightmare. So, yeah. Well, even if the house is burning down, get next door to record it or something. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. crucial. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't so lucky. If I'd asked my parents to record it for me, well, they wouldn't have been at home anyway. Uh, but if, um, well, they could have set the recorder, but they just would have said no. <laughs> um, but there was, a, there was, a, yeah, there was several times where I just didn't get home. It, even though it was on, I, well, yeah, for complicated reasons, I just I, I didn't get home in time. Sometimes I'd miss five or ten minutes of it. It's horrible. And then one time I was watching it, and we were going camping for the weekend, and there was like five or five minutes left or so. And I was like, "Can I just watch?" No, no, you can't watch the end. No, and I just had to leave, which was painful, really, really sad. And I just yeah, didn't record it. Didn't record it at all. Yeah. It was, um, so sometimes I missed it, which yeah, it was it was bad, you know. But so. Uh, well, there was one thing I was just going to ask you, if, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Did, do, do you, when you're when you're watching it, do you sit there and wonder? Um, 
sort of what the graphics are concealing. Like, for instance, when Lilith struck the rocks from beneath them, you just sort of saw it just went dong and, you know, the, the screen sort of closed up and you didn't see. But there's other times when they die from falling off into a, a chasm or whatever, and you actually see the kid fall. And yeah. I'm thinking, right, so yeah. what's the, is it a crash map? <laughs> and did the kid <laughs> know that they were about to fall off something? Yeah, I was thinking that like, it, there's times where they have to climb into a well as well. It's yeah. like, well, I what mean, then? I'm assuming there's not a well there. So where are they actually going? You know. So does someone um, then just come up and whisper to them, right? We're just going to walk you to the next screen. You know. <laughs> the the magic of television, eh? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I I I spent some time on the on the nightmare dot com website, which is like so autistically detailed. I actually love it. I actually love mm. the time and care. I mean, that's what the internet used to be about. Just like extreme autism on things like this that don't matter. Um, yeah. But um, I spent more of my time reading about the law than about like how it got like behind the scenes stuff. So, um, like I didn't I didn't realize that um, the uh, I didn't realize there was like backstories and things behind like each of the characters and so on. Um, that that giant from series one like loses his he loses that chamber to a troll, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. It's the same room, but a troll comes into it afterwards. So I don't know what that's happened right. there. And the troll, the troll is creepy. Like the troll, sort of in one they encounter the troll a few times, but in one time he's just he's watching this kid right in front of his face, just licking his lips and stuff. It's like that's I think that would be very distasteful now. I mean, it, obviously, the, you know, he means like he's going to eat him, but it's like yeah. it's, it's like unpleasantly suggestive at the same time. You know, there's there's quite a few things like that. There's there's one where a character called Sylvester Hands comes up and like he's being covetous for whatever the dungeon is holding, yeah. but he's really in his personal space, like like his hands on him and stuff. And it's like, Ugh. you know, <laughs> it's like it's really sort of interfering with him. It's like, oh, get off. <laughs> Um, do, that do you want to see a little bit of um, uh, Hodris, the confused? Uh, what's his name? Hodris. Hodris. Name of... Yeah, he's Hodris, he the confuser. Is it? Yeah, he's a good character. Yeah. Let's let's have a little uh, look of him. Because you would put him above Lilith, would you? I like him. Yeah. I. I yeah. Yeah. I quite like Cedric. I thought Cedric was quite funny. Cedric the Mad Monk. Yeah. Yeah, he's a uh, yeah. He's played very well. He's kind of like this uh, mm. caustic uh, kind of um, you Golly. know, take a no nonsense kind of. He, but he seems like he'd uh, give you a good punch as well if he needs to. Mm. Oh, left. Yeah. Oh, those are the goblins. Yeah, and again, and again, quick, quick. Move forward, quick. Move. Warning, team. <laughs> Fucking hell! Look, look at this. So these these tunnels were a complete waste of time. Nothing happens in these tunnels. Did I, did anyone ever die? You know, there's that room where the there's the spikes and they have to time the run. Did anybody ever die doing that? Because I, I I feel like there are certain rooms where they just don't kill them. Like yeah. So there's the one with the fire coming through the floor. There's the one with the spikes closing in from either side, and there's also the scorpion. And I think in each of those, people blatantly, on a couple of occasions, people blatantly get it wrong and they still don't get killed. So it's yeah, pretty. That, what's that kind of skeleton archway thing? The I, I, I claim that you can't die on that as well because they blatantly touch it and it, they still don't die. Yeah, it's called the catacomb bite. Um, catacomb yeah. bite, yeah. That, yeah, they touch it, and, and he says one touch is deadly, and they touch it, and he doesn't die, right? So yeah. Yeah, that's pretty I mean, scary as well. That thing, that hologram catacomb bite thing. Mm. Where am I? Right, you're standing on a bridge yeah. over a great big chasm. Yeah. And on the bridge in front of you, there is some food. Food. Okay, Leo. Uh, do you want to go go forward slowly? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Is there a Stop. You really cannot pass, you know. Not before someone of higher breeding such as myself. <laughs> no, no. You'll just have to go back. Or perhaps <laughs> go down. Gosh. There's almost no there's almost no doubt in my mind that this was uh, the basis for Morgana. Morgana? 
that, that this was the basis for more car from Heroes Quest, without doubt, in my opinion. Ah, right, yes. This is an encounter with one who has many names. The Druids, however, called him Hordris the Confuser. He is neither specifically on the light side nor the dark side. I would say instead he is a distinct shade of dark grey and should be taken very seriously. You must find some way to impress him. For if he senses his weakness, he could turn nasty. Uh. <laughs> You have offended my dignity. Prepare to meet your end. Leo, show no fear. I, I don't, I'm not frightened of you. <laughs> are you not? Uh, what particular you not sort of have action, are you? action. This is too tiresome. Right. You have offended me. If Sorry. you cannot show respect, then I'll just have to show you some. Spell cast. Rise, please. S W O R D. There's really no need to take that sort of attitude, you know. Ooh. If you really feel that strongly about it, <laughs> then I'm quite happy to withdraw. Oh, I would like to to you, sir. The path is all yours. Did you trust me? How quickly do you... Well, do, do they do that every time? That's a that's an interesting, uh, an interesting way of getting rid of him. Yeah, I think that was a waste. Uh, I think all you need to do is just show him respect and sort of make him, yeah, make him think you're his equal kind of thing by, by what you say. <laughs> was, that they, they, have they, they blown that spell now? Do they yeah. need it later on? <laughs> I think that's it. They've, they've used it. <laughs> you must dispel, or the sword will turn Quick. on Leo. Dispel D W O R S. Okay, Leo, you're fine now. Okay, so I walk forward? Yep, all right. Walk forward. Oh. Um, is there any gaps or anything? No. Yeah. Did, did anybody die from, like, lingering too long? I, don't, I never see anybody, like, actually die from lingering. I think they, um, always, they always send in either the sort of the, the knight or the goblins to rush you along, and people always do. I, I don't remember anyone dying yeah. from lingering. I, it's, just, it's just to increase suspense, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the first? something like a bread or something? Yeah, put yeah. it in your knapsack. Okay. Yeah, done that. All right, walk forward. Where am I? Right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, have a look at, uh, Horus, before we hit the super chats uh, in terms of uh, nightmare? Any characters you want to highlight? Memories? Uh, f favorite teams? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, I just I actually sent you a picture of the front of the first book. You'll see it in backstage in, in StreamYard. Um, it's just a picture of the, the catacomb bite. Uh, it's, it looks like, I just had a quick search, it looks like there was actually five or six books. I had three of them, and they were good. Right. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, just, I, I was wondering what you think of, like, how this relates to, I mean, I don't watch any children's entertainment today, obviously, but... There you go, yeah. The cat and goon bite looks really scary there, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> but, but like um, how it appears in the how it appears in the show is scary as well, I would suggest. Um hmm. I don't I don't know. Uh let's see if I can I'll, I'll see if I can find it, but carry on talking, carry on talking. It's good that, that picture's got a lot of motion in it. It looks like it's just closing in on you and you're about to get eaten, right? <laughs> but um yeah, it's I I thought that um uh, well I was just interested in what you think of you know whether this would be on TV, like how much this would be changed if it was on TV now, um, because like obviously it's, there's, it's a lot to do with death and people in charge of TV now they don't like you to think in terms of the ultimate, do they? No. Um, life's more about you know just like much more. I don't know, much more modern. I mean, I uh, think I think there's an American thing as well where um, Americans always have to like American entertainment always has to signal the fact that something is a joke or that, some, that something like, oh, that something's not real or that something's not, that you'd never see it played straight in this way on American television in my, in my view, because they have to signal that for like, you know, the slow kid at the back always. And mm. I feel like the influence of American culture has been such that were this on today, they would, 
they wouldn't play it straight. There would be more of a nod and a wink to the audience as if to say, you know, they'd, they'd, um, they'd camp it up a bit more, I think. Um, I think so. And, well, and also, I think you pointed out to me before the show, there was there were a couple of momentary revivals of Nightmare, right? Yeah. Um, because it continued to be popular when it was shown on. Obviously, a lot of people remembered it very fondly, and it was a it was a popular show at the time. But then, obviously, students and stuff were watching it on Challenge TV and me, uh, Challenge yeah. TV from sort of the two thousands onwards. So that helped um, sort of revive interest in it, and and people tried to bring it back, including the creator was called Tim Child, who was already a TV producer, I think. And he yep. created it in 87. When it was taken off air, it was doing fine. It was getting good ratings. It was really popular and stuff. It was doing great. But CITV just like got a new commissioner in, a new like chief commissioner, like a Tony Hayes sort of character, yeah. a woman. And she uh, and she just cleared out like most of the programs, including this, and just wanted a whole what, new what, Like no reason given for why this was got rid of. Wanted a whole different lineup to CITV and this didn't fit. Basically, uh, I think she got rid of nearly everything, like including Funhouse and and other good stuff. That was another good show. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know, I don't know why you'd get rid of your best shows. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe this was quite high budget. I mean, it had a lot of actors and innovative technology and stuff, so maybe it was just not that profitable. Perhaps I'm not sure. It got good ratings, as I say, but so so then there was also you pointed out to me there was like Nightmare live there was like a live version with ID yeah and i i have seen i have seen nightmare live at um this board game convention that i i used to go to every year i haven't uh i have i've been a bit lazy since the pandemic uh hit i haven't been like since 2000 and uh, whenever it was like 2019 i think or 2000 yeah because the pandemic was 2020 right um but i used to go every year and there was this thing called nightmare live on that but it wasn't it's not uh it's like a kind of you know a um it's not like the original traeger it's like a kind of guy who goes around conventions it's quite fun though um was it done but, with 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 the same sort of gusto as hugo meyer put into traeger no it, it it's um it's much more of a comedy it's like a right. comedy show for nerds like yeah. so everybody there i mean and it was typically shown in a double bill with that um with that other thing that's on, uh, uh, you're in a dark room, Darren. Now you die. So it, it was typically in the same sort of slot as that thing. Um, so you know, it was, but it was played for laughs. And there was like a, uh, at one point they'd bring a massive D20 and roll it down the roll it down the aisle. You know, <laughs> it was that, sound, that little bit sounds cool. The massive D20. Um, but. Well, because that's a different kind of entertainment, right? That's obviously that's obviously sort of postmodern. That's like laughing at how serious things used to be or how earnest yeah. things used to be. And it's like, no, I, I definitely prefer the earnest thing. Uh, I mean, well, like, I mean, Nightmare was you know a little tongue in cheek, obviously. Like, there's there's jokes at, you know by Treyguard about you know that that relate to the real world or you know something like that. You know, they have a they have a joke at the end of one season about it being Christmas coming up and things like this, you know. So it was, you know, it was it was not hundred percent po faced or serious, but um you can you know what happened like with geek culture, right? When when I was in school, to be called a geek or a nerd or a dweeb or a boffin or a dork, that was that was an insult. And for me, like I was called those things because I was bookish, you know, I played instruments and stuff. I wanted then to not be a geek, right? I didn't want to be bottom of the pile sort of thing. So I tried to make myself more cool. And so in my yeah. 20s, I was more cool, right? But then what do I find? Geeks became, geeks declared themselves cool. And people started yeah. wanting to be called a geek. And then and then obviously, like, what, what do geeks do? Oh, we play board games, you know, we, 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 we watch things from the 80s and stuff. It's like, what's this? You know, you actually want to be a dweeb? Like, what, what's that all about? So this, so reviving Nightmare became part of that culture. Which again is postmodern to me. It's like it's, it's not the same thing. Yeah, and I, I was I was also very unhappy about the about the attempt to um, make geeks cool. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I, I actually did a video about it uh, called "The Rise and the Fall of the Geek." I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> and the um, rise again. Yeah. So the well, my whole thesis in that in that video, I'll just I can just play you a bit of that video if you want. Um, is where I where I basically argue that um, the the attempt to make geeks um, popular, if you want, 
um, with, I mean, I, I remember it was like, it was done through uh, Doctor Who and various other oh, vectors. Um, the attempt to make the geek popular basically resulted in, um, uh, how can I say, like, because there was status attached to it, then girls started attaching themselves to it uh, yeah. because it was because it was cool, not because it was geeky, and it destroyed the heart of the thing. Let's see if you can find that video. I'll just play play a bit of that video, and um, we can have a little discussion if you want. That immediately um, makes me think of like really like genuinely quite hot cosplay girls and stuff, and like the you know. Yeah, uh, I, I've got a I've got a tiny clip by the way. Apparently, uh, the, the stream went down. I'm seeing that people said for um for copyright so I, I won't play too much of this but there is the catacomb i mean it's pretty scary look, i mean look at that. I mean, that, that's horrifying look at that yeah, yeah. absolutely horrifying underneath him is a coin <laughs> underneath him is a pie there we go um but let, let, let me let me just play you a bit of my old rise and fall of the geek video and i'll get some of your let me see uh, if you agree with my basic take here hold on Greetings. It is I, Simon Quinlake, the original Duke of Hobby. Here is another hobby to regale upon your ears if you currently are feeling that your hobby life is one hobby short. When I was growing up, the geek was relentlessly filleried by popular culture. What do you mean? Some bourbon biscuits, a virulin record or cassette, a flask of weak lemon drink, and a lockable room. It was not uncommon to see scenes like this just on a normal episode of Children's BBC. Yes, and as you can see, it is time once again to meet the Anorak. I'm back! Hello, um, Zoe. It's so nice to meet you. Yes, the man who knows everything there is to know yeah. about Children's BBC. Um, do, do you remember him, Horace, the Anorak? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'd never see him on TV now. No. Not in the same way. That It would be a much more sympathetic depiction of the Anorak. <laughs> We know lots about you. Norma and I are big fans. We've watched you on The Ozone, Play Days. Oh, yes, lovely, <laughs> lovely very much. And, and we also you... know you like peanut butter and jam sandwiches, so we've made you oh, some. How lovely, oh. how lovely. They smell funny. What's in here? Pork lunch and meat as well for extra succulents. Oh, gosh. Well, that's all that. Save those all till later on. Thank you very much, Anorak. It's now time to play Beat the Anorak. Claire, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hello, Claire. You ready to play Beat the Anorak? Yeah. Where are you calling from? Peterborough. Peterborough. And you've got your support there, haven't you? Gina's with you. Yeah. Cheers. Hello, Gina. Hello, Gina. Hello. And if you don't know the rules, all they have to do is answer questions about Children's BBC. The first person who knows the answer shouts, Oh, oh no! no! Yes, just like that. Hit Claire. Let's have a practice. You see, this only worked because he was made to seem abnormal against yeah. like the backdrop of normality right so it's obvious he's a figure of fun whereas uh mm. you fast forward a few years and uh they're they're trying to make this same character into something like aspirational in a strange way i know I'm not loud enough loud enough is everybody ready to play yeah. and here we go <clears throat> quiz master zoe can you name question number one can you name our top new cartoon that begins tomorrow uh, I know. Claire, you were there first. The Box Master. Fantastic. One point to Claire. Woo! Okay, number two. Can you sing the theme tune to Biker Grove? I know. I know. Oh, I think he beat me you. Me first. Me first. Me first. Ooh, biker. <laughs> biker. Biker <laughs> Grove. Yes, all right. <laughs> but for a bonus point. First, let us define our two. So, um, yeah, so, so, so basically I define geeks as being like obsessively interested in something. Um collecting trivial bits of information about it, being socially inept, and being neither exclusively white and male. Would you agree with that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definition of the geek? I remember Simon Quinlack as well, yeah. yeah. Um, and just to fast forward a little bit, uh, so there's the, uh, th this was the attempt to make the geek cool through like Doctor Who, oh, God. Appealing, appealing to women, you know. Um, and then there was this, this sort of character, uh, this was um Ben Whishaw. Yeah, this was Q in the, the James Bond films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they, and he was he was Pingu in Nathan Barley as well. Um and then there this was the social network, if you remember, mm. you know, with the the T the depiction of Zuckerberg, and then we get all this bollocks, which is what you're talking about, right? The Yeah. God, I didn't know it had actually gone this far. 
Yeah, I mean, and also the massive expansion of conventions in general as well. And then, cool. and then all of this sort of thing, where you know the den of geek and Mister Plinkett, yeah. and so all of these things, right? All of these things. You see, what what happened is that everybody on the internet imagines that this is alternative culture, right? You imagine that the Mister Plinkett reviews are alternative, but in fact they are mainstream and dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody today in two, to, uh, 2022 would say that red letter media is alternative media. It's not alternative. It, it is absolutely like the most watched movie show in the world. So you cannot, you cannot claim that this is the counterculture. And, and of course the thing is, is that in real life, this is a, this is the same kid who would have been bullied in the eighties is now sitting on top of the pile. If that makes any sense. So it, it is, and also they were weaponized for um, basically critical theory or, or woke, you know, as they say now. Like, um, like I mean, you know, that was easily fed into all these things. That yeah, like you know, we're here for a Star Wars, we're here for Lego, but also we're anti-racist as well. Like that was that was all fed into it. It was all weaponized for by use uh, for use by the establishment as well. Yeah, and and I mean, Gamergate, the... Gamergate showed that. You know, Gamergate was where there was a fight over that. Yes, and um, yeah, one of the things I was going to say, though, um, just on the subject of red letter media, at some point I want to explore how vectors like this, the, the, the geek angle, right, is inherently like apolitical because... Mm. Except frame, for racism. <laughs> right, apart from racism, right, yeah. the frame of geekdom, um, you can get into like a... Um, a mindset where you're into the law and you're into the thing itself, right? Therefore, the um, you're not really allowed to think outside of that frame with, mm. within, like, the fandom. Um, and you saw this a lot with Star Wars, right? With when uh, there was the backlash against uh, Ray and all the Mary Sue stuff. Do you remember all of that? Yeah. Where, where a lot of the people who are, like, t-shirt wearing like star wars fanboys had this kind of cope where it was like well this has been like all through star wars fans have had a backlash against it this is what it is we have to accept it and because my thing is star wars like they made peace really quickly with that fact and then and then defended it because you know that's what you're meant to do quote in the fandom um and what else that, are you going to do stop being a star wars fan it's unthinkable but, but, so but that that kind of mindset basically um, makes you immune from, like, uh, connecting Star Wars to any, anything wider. Um, and then, and then the flip side is um, the very famous reviews of Star Wars that Red Less Media did. Um, um, he was coming at it as a film geek, as opposed to a Star Wars geek, right? So he was coming at at it from within the from within the film fandom rubric rather than the star wars fandom rubric um mauler actually does the same thing in, in in many ways um when he's critiquing star wars um but that of course um means that you're criticizing the prequels for movie making reasons um and not considering how they were actually this like pretty detailed critique of neocon foreign policy <laughs> which um which i want to reconnect people with uh at some point in this in this coming year, because um, I think people will look back on the prequels as the masterpiece of our time to understand the power structure that George Lucas was actually trying to get at in the Phantom Menace. And who, <laughs> who, who, what does Jar Jar Binks represent? I mean, I assume you agree with the the theory about Binks being in league with or even superior to Darth Sidious, right? <laughs> Have you, no, no, I, no, I, no, no, there's no, a serious like, case to be made for that, and it actually like, it in, makes my, sense. in my mind, um, Jar Jar Binks is best represented by like the kind of um, the kind of GOP senator, like Lindsey Graham or someone like that, you know, who yeah, who uh, you know, holds up the more for it, the more for Israel signs or whatever, you know. Um, Mate, I mean, you might think you're joking, but look, look at the, there's a couple of videos on YouTube that show that show this theory. I think you'll be, I'll be interested to hear what you think. I, there's a strong theory that Jar Jar Binks very, very subtly is manipulating everyone all along. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm no fan of Jar Jar Binks, but I, I like the prequel movies more after seeing that theory. It actually, throws them in a better light. But uh, just one. Oh, sorry, go on. Go on. 
Yeah, we should get back to Nightmare, by the way. Just, uh, just yeah. one other thing, just you know, just to do with the geek culture thing. I mean, the same thing happened with atheism as well. I was amazed about sort of seven or eight years ago when I found out there was such a thing called the atheism scene or, or whatever it, you know, with like, yes, um, like YouTube is like Thunderfoot and people like that. I, I, I just never knew there was like, what, why, what, what is there to talk about with atheism? It's just, just don't believe in God, right? I mean, <laughs> no, yeah. apparently there's a whole scene around it, and it's all to do with science and stuff. That again, it's like totally geeky in one way, but it was also weaponized for certain politics. Like, um, I just, I think that ties in as well. I mean, like, you know, most people who would go to an atheism convention would also go to a, a Star Trek convention or a, or a. Yeah, I mean, I've thought about why this is, and if you've ever been to any of these conventions now, when I go to those conventions, I always feel a bit self-conscious, uh, Horace, because. I'm the sort of guy who might walk around in a tweed jacket, you know, um, um, and I, um, uh, how can I say, like, I don't like smelly people. <laughs> um, whereas you go to these things and there are a lot, you will see creatures from every walk of life, okay? And if you can imagine, those are people who are used to being ostracized and pilloried in in normal society. Mm. So they go to the Comic-Con or to the board game convention as a safe space where they are free, where they are accepted for who they are without judgment. And there's no judgment in that space. It doesn't matter if you're fat. It doesn't matter if you're smelly. It doesn't matter if all you do is um, eat takeaway pizzas and pints of, um, you know, full fat Coca-Cola. It doesn't matter if you speak with a stutter. It doesn't matter if you have no social skills. It doesn't matter if you spend every waking hour watching Star Trek, uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter what sorts of games you're in. The the basic um, ethos of those places is non-judgment. You don't judge someone for their um, their kind of character traits because that's who they are. And who they are is a geek, man, or, or, or I'm a nerd, man, and that's my thing. Hmm. It's not a million miles away from that to SJW values. No. You know, you don't judge me because I'm, you know, LGBTQ plus, or you don't judge me because I'm a furry, or you don't judge me because I watch, uh, you know, anime lolly porn or whatever. Yeah. Furries are the bridge, if anything, aren't they? They're the bridge between geekdom and SJW. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that, um, I actually think that uh, the uh, the cosplay angle is interesting here mm. because I feel like. Um, there's a lot of women who go to those spaces who dress up in the cosplay, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they're dressed. They could be dressed up as Game of Thrones characters or superheroes or whatever. But it's a nice little chance for those women to dress because if you can imagine, most people have gone there to, to play games or to be into whatever the, the thing is, right? Um, those girls go there to dress up and to have those men gawp at them if that yeah. makes any sense they get attention from it yeah. and it's obviously its own thing and because there's this veneer of non-judgment nobody really says anything about it um but there's this how can i say like that cosplay element is a sneaky little attack vector yeah. whereby you can inject people who don't really have an interest in the thing into those spaces if that makes any sense so, Absolutely. like, the cosplayer is also, you know, some sort of, like, social justice activist, you know, yep. inserted <laughs> in there. And they don't actually have to, I don't know, understand the rules of D&D &D or whatever the, whatever the thing happens to be, right? Yeah, yeah. and they'll, they'll, they'll avoid any conversation that could expose their own ignorance about it. <laughs> they just want to flirt with people and take photos and put it on Instagram and stuff, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean... The, the, I mean, the geek atmosphere, like, you know, when I, when I was a genuine geek playing like Warhammer in the shop for a whole Saturday when I was, you know, 12, uh, the atmosphere was so totally unsexual. If there was like a girl in the shop, that was quite unusual, but she'd be a really dweeby girl as well, right? Whereas when, the, you know, you go to conventions, there's like cosplay element, they might be quite a genuinely sexy girl or like, you know, maybe she might have a rough face or something, but, you know, she, she's got loads of makeup on or a mask, so it doesn't matter. And like you know, when when sex comes back into the geek culture, that's a whole that's actually quite threatening to real geeks. You know, it's like because <laughs> I, I I kind of got into this to not think about girls. You know, because <laughs> girls always reject me. That's you know that sort of thing. 
Um, yeah. And then when, when when sex and like you know who who's going to get a, you know who's yeah. going to get a number sort of thing. And the other thing about the other thing about like genuine genuine geeks um, um, in those sorts of spaces are because of the sort of people they are. If they come into contact with like a real woman, especially one who's got like proper tits and like a yeah, yeah, yeah. nasty could look at, you know, um, dressed up as Bap Girl or whatever, you know, or Supergirl or whatever she, she's come as, um, they'll crumple up and fold up very quickly when faced with a genuine woman, right? Yeah, um, yeah hide from her. And, yeah. and so that, how can I put it? It's not just entryism. These cosplay girls have a lot of like weird power in those spaces yeah, over absolutely. the over the fat nerds. Take over the um, room. Take over the whole place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's kind of a, it's a very it's a very interesting dynamic to see played out in real life. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, all I all I do when I'm in those places is try not to look too disdainful um, and to you know hide my natural contempt because. In, in actuality, I am the outlier in those spaces, not not them, you know. So, do you ever just uh, ask like go up to one of the cosplay girls and like challenge her, like, "Have you read Pareto? Have you read Pareto?" <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, in my in my experience, um, certainly in board gaming, girls can wreck a board gaming group. I know that much. Mm -hmm. uh, if they actually cut, like, because they'll. You know, if, especially if you're in a serious group that plays to win, you know, and takes no fucking prisoners. You know, if somebody starts losing and they go into a pout, like, what do you do with that? How do you deal with that? You know, it's not a it's not a question that blokes are used to having to deal what, with. And yeah, yeah and, then, and, then, and then one of your mates starts going out with her and then you don't see him much anymore and then you're not playing your game anymore. And oh, she's ruined it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, of, all of the above. Yeah. It always happens. <laughs> <laughs> there is no, I mean, I, I've said many times, girl, um, uh, boys and girls can't be friends. And if, if it's a, if it's true male pursuit, it's very difficult to insert women into those sorts of settings without without destroying the fundamental d dynamic, in my view. Um, Which is essentially her intention, whether she admits it to herself or not. So, uh, so uh, people are saying I'm coping, saying I'm I'm not meant to be there. Um, I mean. I don't know. Last time I went, by the way, um, for the first time ever, it started to get a bit political, and they started doing like jokes at the expense of Brexiteers and things like that. <sighs> I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. Um, so... That that really is dweeby as well. That is the mark of a dweeb. Someone who someone who brings someone who tries to make humor out of politics. It's like oh, it's rubbish. <laughs> I remember um, Stuart Lee. Oh, sorry, I'm getting well off the point of Nightmare. That, you know, obviously this all related yeah. to Nightmare as in the second iteration of Nightmare was ironic and sort of, yeah. you, know, you know, laughing at itself. But just, sorry, I know you want to go to the Super Chats, but just before, like, Stuart Lee, I used to think was a really, really funny guy. I used to think he was a yeah. brilliant comedian. And in 2010, the Tories got back in and there was like a consensus among comedians, like, right, now we do political stuff, you know. Politics goes to bed when Labour are in power because that's the way things are supposed to be. Yeah. And then now the Tories back in now. Now we get political again. I saw Jeremy Hardy do the same thing um, at Glastonbury. It's like every joke, the punchline was just the Tories. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I I saw Stuart Lee live a few times. Um, like, um, I think the Tories were in. And he didn't really get that political in the, in those particular shows. Like he talked about, um, this was the one about like the the um, the paperclip merchant or something. I seem to remember or like <laughs> something about. I mean, it was all quite. I mean, I I always rated Stuart Lee. Um, I haven't seen him recently. Um, I do know he's become like a massive twat recently, though, with, yeah. in terms of his uh, being woke and all of that. I also used to like Richard Her Herring. I, mm. I saw him live a few times too. Um, I even met him. Um, uh, you know, after the show, he signed something, and um, like both of them have just become. It, it, it's it's a shame, really, that um, there's nobody. That most people who are involved with these things have kind of massively gone in for like the woke thing, and it kind of destroys them. It just stops them being like, you know, um, I've seen so many heroes of mine succumb to that. Like Robert De Niro is probably the most prominent example. <laughs> Like there was a time when I would never miss a Robert De Niro movie. Like no. you know, I watched everything, even like the obscure ones, like uh, I don't know, Angel Heart or whatever. But um, now I just think he's a twat. You know, now 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 in the Joker when 
Joker shot him, I was happy not just for the character, but also because, you know, <laughs> Robert De Niro is literally that person in real life as well. You know, Sad. Did he direct that as well? What, Joker? No, no, no. It was directed oh, okay. by... Um, I don't know if he helped produce it. I can't remember who directed the Joker. He's directed a few films, but Todd, none of them are Todd, very good. Todd Phillips. Todd Phillips. Oh, okay. um, yeah, De Niro, De, Niro, De Niro is usually a, a producer on movies. Um, he directed The Good Shepherd, though. Did you ever see that? It had a lot of potential, but it just was disappointing. <laughs> um, I don't think I did see The Good Shepherd, actually. It's one of the oh. very few uh, very few ones that escape Because I used to collect them on VHS. And, um, you know, I'd have, like, my De Niro collection, my Pacino collection, and I don't think I ever got the good the good Shepherd. And then you um, moved on to uh, laser discs, did you? No, the Good Shepherd was in the 2000s, and it's about the early proto-CIA, uh, Skull and Bones and all that. And uh, it's quite interesting subject matter, but the film, it's just, it's just not that well-directed, but it's not bad. It's not bad. It's just a little bit boring. Yeah, I think I, I think basically I gave up on both Pacino and De Niro um, around the, they did a film together called I don't remember what it was called now. Um, it hey. wasn't very. Was it called Righteous Kill? Righteous okay. Kill, I think. Um, something like that. I, I don't know. I, I gave up in them in, in sometime in the mid in the mid two thousands, where De Niro basically became this kind of um, parody of himself. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, analyze, meet the fuck. Analyze and that. Sort of <laughs> yeah. Um, but but anyway, any any final comments on Nightmare before we hit the super chat? Well, just I mean, just to, to sort of run it up, I just think it was really, really thrilling TV when I was a child. Really loved it. I was enthralled from the first second to the end, and I couldn't I couldn't stand it finishing. I wanted another episode, another one, another one. I didn't want to wait a week for another one. That's how exciting it was, and it was. It was, I mean, it, it, the fact that it was um, harsh and quite, you know, violent, at least implicitly violent, that added to the thrill of it. You take that away, it would not have, you know, it's, it would be like cutting the balls off. It was, it was, it was like just, the, it was pitched very well for the age group. It was, you know, who was playing it and who was watching it. Um, it was my kind of thing because it was fantasy and like, yeah, medieval mixed with, you know, goblins and all this stuff. Uh, it could not have been better to my sort of eight, ten-year-old self. It was thrilling. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And um, yeah, I've no interest in any sort of ironic remakes or, or later versions. They, uh, they, they obviously, they obviously missed the point. <laughs> the point wasn't to wink at you. It was, it was, it was as you say, played straight. And I think that was the the best thing about it. So yeah, I just loved it. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about like. Um that whole thing of playing it straight seems to seems to um a lot of things were played straight in the 80s you know all of the uh all of the arnie and um and uh sliced loan kind of action movies were pretty straight up i mean there are a few one-liners here and there but they weren't like winking at the camera saying oh this is a movie by the way total recall um, does that but most of them don't um i'm trying to think of some other like there was a like uh the conan movies came out they're they're so pretty straight uh all of the sword and sorceries movies uh that came out in the in the 80s yeah so i don't know if was, yeah. yeah i don't know if that was like you know we say that um thatcher and reagan didn't really do much on the culture front but like on this show um one of the things that me and pharaoh have done is look at um, is look at adverts from different ages, and we noticed this with the adverts as well. Like there was a lot of like shad men in the adverts, and like women kind of imagining themselves like picking fruit in a in a in a lovely field, or um, you know, or there's a touch of romance. Like if you can imagine the the woman in the bath with a flake and all this sort of stuff. So you know, there's a lot of like macho men and feminine women in the eighties. It's very and it's and it's not done for, it's not done in a tongue in cheek way. It's served mm. straight, and I, I wonder if um, it, when the ninety when the nineties really gets going, it starts undercutting everything and making fun of all of those conventions. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of some examples in in the pop oh, culture that uh, I was fascinated started. by your stream about lad culture was was a good example of that and really really interesting. I thought. 
Yeah, um, I mean, the, the the lad culture thing had subversive elements, I thought, um, in the 90s. But I'm just trying to think of some touchstones that really, like, I, I, I tell you a, a pretty good example is Austin Powers. Austin Powers. <laughs> now, the Austin Powers movies were funny, right? Mm -hmm. But they were also postmodern, and they were also making fun of genre conventions again and again and again. Um, it, there's another one I just remembered. Monkey Island, right? Now the Monkey Island films are funny and they're good. The, the Monkey Island games are funny and good, okay? Um, and they, they probably still hold up now, you know. Um, give or take a few, like point and click. Uh, some of the puzzles are really difficult at Monkey Island, but yeah, um, it, it was also making fun of a lot of geek culture references, and it kind of turned in on itself. Now, if you can imagine that Monkey Island came out when in like. 1994 or something hmm. you already start to see the culture start to critique itself endlessly you know um and um yeah oh uh, well i just i did a chat with i don't know if you know Erba Derba, but um it's a, a fellow i did a, i did a stream with uh, sort of about this time last year it's on my channel it's called um joy and cynicism in entertainment and it's about what what i very crudely called the transition from the old entertainment to the new where the old was represented by Keith Harris of Orville fame, and the new yeah, was represented yeah. by um, Louis Theroux, who, who did a program with Keith Harris after Harris was off TV, and he's yeah. doing like pantomimes and stuff. And it's yeah, the whole discussion is about what you've just mentioned. So I, I recommend people watch that on my, on my Odyssey channel. I mean, people are saying that Last Action Hero does that. Last Action Hero was came out in 1993. If, if memory serves, or if it, if it wasn't 1993, it was the early 90s at the very least. And what I'm saying is, is that by the nine, by the time the 90s swing around, you've already seen like a dozen Arnie action movies. So, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger starts to star in movies that start to make fun, like starts to unravel and make fun of itself. Um, you know, I'm doing Batman um, month next month. Um and if people want to start preparing for, if you want to play along at home, um, I'm not only watching all of the movies, um, including the DC animated ones. Um, I'm also going to do a comic book run, like looking at all of the trade paperbacks from probably from Nightfall up until the present. I, I won't go any further back into the Bronze Age or anything, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's going to be a pretty like... It's going to be a, a study in autism, the, the Batman month. I'm going to try to do it justice. Um, but if you, if you have a look at the Batman movies, you know, uh, Tim Burton, okay, it's still Tim Burtonized, but it's still served pretty straight, Batman and Batman Returns, right? There are, there are some comedic elements in there, but it's still, like, recognizably serious. By the time you get to, to the Joel Schumacher Batman, it's a very 90s. It's very tongue in cheek. It's very the culture it's turning back on itself. Self consciously cheesy in the in the third and fourth one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but by the time and, and that's uh, and that's where I was going. Um, and then of course you have literally Arnold Schwarzenegger in that movie. You know. Oh dear. Um, so that's a zero. That film. That's one of the. That's a zero out of ten. I, I, I would say the only probably the only element of it is Arnie. Like, because he, he at least seems to be aware of what he's in, I suppose. Um, that's, um, yeah, that's among the very worst films I've ever seen. But the Tim Burton bad. ones, the Tim Burton ones, that's a good fit. That's a very natural fit. That's a good director for Batman. That's, that really works. Uh, yeah. I don't know why there's, there's, this, there's this consensus that the, the Nolan ones are automatically better, but I don't agree at all. Yeah, I, I need to, um, I actually need to rewatch them for this. I'm, I'm hoping to rewatch them for. Uh, Deepest Law in two weeks' time, I think, is the movie one. You'd, you'd have to check the forward schedule, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's just another example of how like um, how you get this kind of uh, cycle where the seriousness or the earnestness of the eighty stuff starts to get undercut. Um, it happened. It actually happened in pro wrestling as well. Like probably like the least um, mm -hmm. the least left wing form of all, right? Because like literally Vince McMahon, who'd, who'd probably be a fascist if you wrote down his views. Um, you, you know, even in wrestling, you get a scenario where in the in the 80s, the heroes were, you know, Hulk Hogan, who's for like drinking his mi milk and taking... I want to be American, yeah. Yeah, you know, real American and all I'm the rest of it. Um, 
by the time you get to the by the time you get to the late nineties, Kurt Angle, who's literally a gold like an Olympic gold medalist, uh, turns up in his stars and stripes talking about like the importance of integrity and intelligence and heroism and the and the fans just boo him and tell him he fucking he, sucks. He he is a pure <laughs> hypocrite though, isn't he, as well, right? Like... Um, yeah, I mean they they played they played it up, but I'm, what I'm saying is you would like in in 1986 as opposed to 1996. Um, sorry, I think he debuted in 1998. So let's say in 1988, you would not have been able to play an angle where the or a storyline where an Olympic gold medalist comes in and he's a heel. He would have automatically been a de facto babyface. But something yeah. in the culture turned. Where you couldn't play it straight like that anymore. He had to be a heel under those conditions. You um, noticed that loads of the best wrestler wrestlers were baddies, weren't they? Like Benoit, Mr. Perfect, Ravishing Rick Rude. They were all like proper good. Arn Anderson. They were all really good wrestlers. They could do. Oh yeah, the there's, a, there's, a, there's a very good reason. There's a very good reason for that, Horus. Um, and that is because uh, conventionally the heel leads the ma- leads the match. Um, oh, okay. And the the baby faces like so. If you can imagine a dance, you're dancing, right? The the dan- one put dance par- partner leads, um, hmm. and all of those guys were like Arn Anderson, for example, was so good that he could basically like call a match in the ring. You didn't need to, to script or anything. Okay. You could so you could go in there as a as any old white meat baby face, and he could just lead you around by the nose. Uh, he'd make you look good. He'd make you look like a million dollars. Um, you know, he would make sure that there were puncture points in the match for you to get your, for you to get like massively cheered. He'd also make sure that you'd get his own shit in to, you know, make the crowd boo him. You know, so <laughs> that's uh, that's usually why it was. Oh, okay. uh, was was the better wrestler? Yeah. Um, Benoit took it a bit too far, didn't he? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. In, well, in the end. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's not always that you can you can get great wrestlers who were on the face like ricky ricky the dragon steamboat was a pure baby face who could lead the match for example but um right. it was rarer on that side of things for, for the baby face to be the like the, the worker um some sometimes uh uh like rick martell if you remember him he was a good wrestler who could lead as a baby face but you probably remember him as a heel um okay, okay. Um, shall we, uh, shall we move to the super chats or, uh, finish up uh, any last minute, uh, things on nightmare before we finish up? Thanks. I, I think I said my, uh, my last piece on nightmare. Loved what, it. What was your, <laughs> I'll just ask you a few questions then. Who is, who are your favorite, who was your favorite character going back, um, watching, uh, watching the five seasons that you watched? Apart from Trey Guard. Apart um, from Trey Guard, yeah. I, I quite like Morgana. I think, was her name Morgana? She was... It was it, before Lord Fear. You had Mogdred was most was usually the big baddie. He was fairly good. He just used to do the mwa thing. Yeah, he's um, like this. I mean, I, I'll share my screen so you can. It's fairly here's, scary. Like, he here's Mogdred. Well. He was like the kind of. It, it was fair to say he was the boss. He was like Merlin's, yeah. um, like Dark Alter Shadow Ego. type thing. Yeah, I yeah. think they're the same actor as well. Um, but yeah, and then and they sound quite different. But yeah, m- there was also Morgana who was occasionally his role, and she was quite good looking and stuff. And she she was really sinister, like um, yeah. So I liked her. There you go. Okay. She's reasonably good. And looking, yeah. what was the best series in your view, and why? Um, I guess. I guess the second, because it was before they brought in the Ice Shield, which was a step down, I'd say. And before yeah. they took it, like, they took it out from season three or four onwards, they took it out to, like, forests and stuff, which was sometimes really good, like, in the tavern sometimes and all this. Could be really good, but overall, I didn't like the Ice Shield. I thought that was a waste of time. Um, season two, it was, like, the original format, but they'd improved upon it from the first. So I'd say season two. Yeah. It's largely the same dungeon as well, like, with a couple of updates. Yeah. Seem like yeah. seem like the same, a lot of the same shots were used and um, so on. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So yeah. let's uh, let's have a look at some super chats then. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we did this. Uh, it was a big part of my uh, big part of my childhood and an interesting an interesting kind of look at where things were um, then as a kid. 
Um, I, I actually when when we rebuild civilization after the uh, after the the collapse and rebirth as well, I think there's lessons to be taken from Nightmare about how entertainment and so on should be should be done. So there's that as well. Oh, obviously, I sent you a super chat on on the stream where you first mentioned this, and I said, um, I can't remember my exact words, but it was like step one: restore Nightmare. Step two, re <laughs> retake Constantinopolis. As in, we might be able to get Britain back on its feet, but before we retake all of Europe, you know, from the Turk and stuff, people are going to need to study Nightmare as part of the, the Reconquista. Mm. So, it trains, of, children in... for the, it trains children for the martial, the martial life. I'm, I'm kind of interested now in whether there's a correlation between the culture getting serious quote unquote serious or less serious depending on who's in power because it's just struck me thinking about batman of course 60s batman is not is kind of postmodern and non-serious and pokes fun <laughs> at itself but of course in the 60s you had you know jfk and then lbj in power um by the time you get to the uh, the 70s obviously batman's no longer on television but like in the comics, it becomes very dark and gritty. And of course, film is very dark and gritty in the 70s. Mm. Um, mm. But for most of the 70s, like you have like Nixon and Gerald Ford in power, you know. Mm. And then, um, it, yeah, I just find I just find it kind of interesting as to as to why why you get these kind of dark, dark like not darker, but more serious turns in the culture versus less serious turns. Um, and I, I wonder about that. Of course, of course, we should remember the Tories were in power for most of the nineties in this country as well. Um, but like John Major Tories was different from Maggie Thatcher Tories. This started under Thatcher and then ended under Major. Perhaps that you know that says something like Thatcher was like you know sort of a cardinal sort of initiator force, and Major was like the force of decay and, <laughs> uh, and failure. <laughs> Do you, do you think it gets worse when the the backgrounds become CG as opposed to hand painted though? Like, do you think? Um, yeah, it loses it loses some of the. Um, I'll, I'll just show people what, what the difference is. So, if you're the hand painted backgrounds, you can see those as I'm scrolling through. It's more immersive the hand painted, I think. And then here are the CG backgrounds, which are really quite ugly to look at today. So, yeah, they, they they just feel like what CGI does in films. It just feels unreal. Uh, yeah. Whereas artistry just is more human. Oh, we didn't talk about him much. The dragon. Uh, That's rubbish. <laughs> oh no, sorry, that dragon. Sorry, is that yeah, what, dragon, the, dra yeah, yeah. the dragon they fly on the back of? Yeah. Ah, that's rubbish. I, I, I'll get rid of all that. It's, I thought it was lame. Yeah. Uh, in the in those live shows, the dragon is a large part of it. By the way. Um, <sighs> And it was voiced by a woman, and she and she used to shout, "Dragon, dragon!" like that. It's it's kind of fun live, I suppose. Okay. But, right. um, but I, uh, yeah, I, um, I, uh, I, I, I took that, and uh, we, AAA has got a little cuddly toy dragon. I do that. I do that with. Uh, I do that with that dragon. Uh, anyway, let's uh, let's hit the super chats then. Um, Years the eunuch says. Nightmare was so popular, even I heard about it in my mountain holler in Appalachia when I was a kid. <laughs> I see you, AA, trying to make this obscure, obscure so your Daria spirit will allow you to like it. Little pokey out tongue. So, sorry, Ooh. your Daria spirit. <laughs> yes. um, d d does that surprise you? That <laughs> uh, I'll explain. I'll explain that in a second. I'll explain that in a second. Um, Horace, does it surprise you that Nightmare was um, popular? <laughs> was, 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 does it surprise you that kids in Appalachia, in uh, in the mountains, of, you know, the, in the in the mountain uh, in the Smoky Mountains of America, somewhere in the Midwest, um, ha ha had heard of Nightmare? Because it surprises me somewhat. But it does a bit. But then I think sometimes the sort of quaint English stuff does travel quite well to America. They like to think of us as being into goblins and elves and all that, don't they? So I think I mean, I I'll, how it I'll, works. I'll say something a bit unpopular, probably. I, I think British television is and has always been more inventive and creative than what comes out in America because um, it's more like uh, there's a more direct connection between creators and their product. So somebody could have a creative idea and it would get on the, to the BBC or, or, or on ITV like Nightmare, right? 
Whereas in America, everything has to go through like endless studio committees and, you know, things get pulled after half a season by mm -hmm. fat uh, executives, you know. Um, it's all like too corporate in America. Mm -hmm. So they, yeah. they never let it, like they strangle the creativity out of a lot of things. Um, I like to think that that was the story in, in America in the 80s, 90s, but there was some local TV station in, in Appalachia. That, that just broadcast it and only years saw it <laughs> I'd, I'd love <laughs> i'd love that to be the case um let me see if i can find the daria thing um to explain. she was saying you you've got a daria soul is that yes right? so so let me let me just <laughs> share my share my screen here horus this is actually a reference I made a whole series of videos called Deconstructing the Boomer Regime. I've, yeah, I've seen, right. I think I've seen the one about Daria now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Generation X and the Rise of the Midwit. Now, yeah. I have always said that one of, the one of the reasons it's so difficult for people like me to um, find kind of faith or to, to drop this kind of natural cynicism that we have um, is because when we were kids, we were actually encouraged to be this Daria character. So, and it's not just Daria. Like, Daria is the most cynical, most kind of extreme version of it, right? Where she has this permanent kind of look on her face. She deconstructs everything around her. She psychoanalyzes. She's got like a, she's got kind of rationalizations for everything. She has seen the broken homes of the, of the boomers uh, already, you know, um, but it's there in lesser ways in characters like Alvin from Alvin and the Chipmunks or um, Raphael or Michelangelo from the from the Turtles or like Bart Simpson. We were always encouraged to identify with the smart ass when we were when we were little. And um, that smart assery is at the heart of who being um, somebody of our generation. I mean, we were talking before we came on air about we're, we're both technically millennials. Right. Yeah. But whatever you call this little micro zennial generation, we were encouraged to adopt this kind of sideways look at the world. And, so true. And, you know, this video, you'd be surprised if you click on that and read the comments. So many people just wrote things like, oh, it's like you it's like you um, you, you took a microscope and look, looked at my soul, AA, or I felt really called out or this is me to a T and so on and so forth. It's definitely something. Um, and and I, I actually think it has extremely um, serious and long lasting consequences. Um, so, you know, when I when we talk about rebirth and collapse and so on. I don't believe, I, I think for this reason, I think it's so deeply entrenched in us as children of the ashes, if you want, as Darias, that um, men from our generation will not be able to be the heroes that we need. I think we can help to pave the way, but all our skills in a strange way are, are, are destructive. Are like we are, our skills are all like, we can pull things apart and deconstruct them and critique them and pull them apart but mm. i don't think our skills are in like um like asserting the heroic values in this straightforward and non non-ironic way that that is required um i i i, I even think now that i mean a banake i know everybody hates him right but if, if you ever watch richard spencer talk about talk about heroism he always does it with a smirk on his face and undercuts his point. Like he, it's, it always sounds like he may also be taking the piss out of what he's saying, and so it, it's never clear whether he's sincere or not. Do you know and what else undercuts the point that he puts the fucking NATO and EU flags in his Twitter bio? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, that that as well. But you, you understand, you, under, you understand what I'm saying, though. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. if I. If I came, if, like if I just made a massive video tomorrow saying, "Oh, listen, friends, um, I'm I, I I've converted and I now accept the Lord into my heart," I I guarantee you that even if, it, if even if I was being a hundred percent straight, at least like half the people just wouldn't believe it <laughs> because of the difficulty that we have in being sincere and straight up in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, did you agree with that, Horace? Or 
I do, I do. I mean, um, and irreverence is, is part of the same mix as well. I think, I mean, I, I gave an example of it a minute ago when I was joking about the collapse and the rebirth and, you know, before we retake Constantinople, we need to, that is the same sort of thing, right? It's like joking about something that's actually going to be horrible, absolutely yeah. horrible, right? you know. Um, <laughs> uh, you see, I'm laughing about it now. But, yeah, so I, I agree, I agree. I mean, yeah, it's like it's become people are actually really sort of uncomfortable about sincerity. Um, I, I personally, I've, I've, I've actually consciously striven to overcome that because I think that cynicism can really kill you. That can that can make you ill. Uh, being being so cynical and so yeah, sort of irreverent. It's like no, don't 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 be like that all the time, for goodness sake. But, I, I mean, I've talked I've talked to more like um, I was listening to a show that Morgoth did with uh, Todd Lewis. You know, the praise of folly uh, yeah. one is, um, and. Uh, they were talking about like the prospect of nuclear war, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the sixties and the seventies, they lived under the shadow of the prospect of nuclear war. Okay, mm -hmm. and they were talking about how you know the British government or the American government would constantly play preparation scenarios for what would happen if there was uh, a nuclear war. You know, shelters to go to, you know, hide under your table, whatever it is. Um, now we are in a very real situation, like a genuine situation where we could be on the brink of a nuclear war. And there hasn't been any prep of that nature whatsoever. It's just narrative. Like now the prospect of nuclear war is just another narrative. Um, it, that's another... our rulers in the media threatening us with nuclear war. That's basically what's happening. It, the, other, um, the, the other thing that I've talked about with Morgoth is that... Um, I don't know if you remember uh, alien, like the prospect of meeting aliens, <laughs> you know, like, uh, now this sounds bizarre, but a while back, like last year, the, the former head of the Israeli, like, space science team, like the, the chief rocket scientist of, of Israel, came out and basically just confirmed that, yes, aliens are real, yes, we've had contact and all the rest of it. It was published in all the newspapers. Nobody cared nobody batted an eyelid and like literally people in people who we talked to just went yeah man we've seen it all before now like when i like when we were teenagers the idea that there would be aliens was a mind like not just mind-blowing but epoch changing serious news now it's just like oh yeah we've seen this in movies a hundred times already nobody cares when people like, how did that happen People who believed that aliens were out there and, you know, close to being contacted, they would say, can you imagine the moment when, when the media finally admit or, you know, or when it comes out, when it finally comes out, it's like, no, but it does come out and no one gives a shit or it's not yeah. true, but no one's annoyed that it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Weird time. Very weird time. Infernal 460 says, this was one of my earliest kids shows I ever saw when CBBC was in a radio booth. Yes, um, but uh, remember, of course, that this was on CITV, and not uh, CBBC, but uh, yes. Um, Utis4321 says, Horus, any plans on new content? Yeah, I am I'm researching for a new video at the moment. It's going to be about the European Union. Um, uh, the book I'm reading to do it is really long, so I'm just still reading through the book. I'm, I'm getting towards the end. Um, and you know, I, I read it carefully to take notes and stuff. But also, I, <laughs> I then hit on another dimension, so I might make it more ambitious. But it also means it will take longer as well, because I've decided to read all the books of uh, Kudno Kadaji as well, uh, and relate that to it. Um, so yeah, so I am, I am, yeah, I, I am, I am working on new content. But I, I don't know, it could be weeks, more weeks yet. So yeah, yeah. Um, someone, somebody in the somebody in the chat was saying that uh people people in their generation also mock and deconstruct um those nuclear fallout movies as well right <laughs> the duck and cover stuff you know um there was the war game have you ever seen the war game no i haven't was, what's that it was banned it was it was by peter watkins i don't know he's apparently famous for other things i think you might have done kathy come home or something anyway the war yeah. game is a is a mixed drama documentary and the documentary is supposed to be, well, it's just the reality of what would happen in contrast to the government videos. It's based in Britain. And it's like, right. 
it's like you know they tell you that yeah you you know you might have to like budge up and house someone else in your home or something but your home will be fine and you'll eat basically yeah. normally there'll be ra- some things will be rationed but you'll be fine and all this stuff and then they show the reality of it it's just like society coming apart you know like threads similar to threads but um, yeah. made in the 60s as well it's really, it's really I mean, hard hitting for the time I mean the thing is if, if a nuclear bomb went off and I hid under my table it would just like fucking it, it, it like it, nobody would send a shot everything would just be disintegrated right is, is that not the case like, yeah, well, it depends how close you are to the center, doesn't it? Of the my, my my only frame of reference is that scene from Terminator Two, as I said. The you, you, uh, you, the Sarah you, Connor, you, the Sarah Connor vision, you know. <laughs> you want to be in the blast, really? Like, what is the point in trying to live in a post nuclear holocaust? Like, what? What? <laughs> it's more miserable. Like they say that in the war game, they say, "Would the living come to envy the dead?" And I think it's literally true. I would just, I'd rather just be vaporized. Uh, I remember playing Fallout Two. It was pretty. Be. Pretty depressing, to be honest. You know, <laughs> war never changes. <laughs> um, Ron Perlman says that. Uh, Yuck's interior says a friend was on this. When you reach the end of the room, a burly crew member would grab you by the shoulders and turn you in the right direction. There you go. <laughs> I assume that must be true because they can't have a, a huge warehouse, can they? Like, it's got to be sort of directed to some extent, physically. Uh, Nathan C.J. Hood says Walter White was a variant of the cool geek. Uh, I suppose he was. Uh, Did you watch Breaking Bad, Horus? I saw one episode. Um, Yeah, no, not much. I enjoy. To be honest, I did enjoy it. I did enjoy your break. I thought it was very good television. Um, Although I will say that the by like season five or six, the constant face and heel turns gets. They start to get a bit telegraphed after a while. It's just like. Come on, he's turning face now. Um, and, you know, well, the thing is, is that a lot of people were comparing Breaking Bad to Shakespeare because, you know, the shades of grey, it's not clear who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, sympathetic villain, all this sort of stuff, or anti-hero, which is a lot of, you know, Shakespeare has a lot of this stuff in it. Um, but I was like, yeah, but what about the accessory telegraph face and heel turns um you don't really get those in shakespeare to the same extent so and also and also what they're saying what he copied they copied shakespeare like is that impressive or what <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i i did i i did enjoy breaking bad though um there are like the, the other the other problem with breaking bad is that um american tv has got this very set thing where like i don't know was it 24 episode episodes to a season or 25 episodes to a season so so every once in a while you get these like obvious filler episodes where nothing happens yeah so oh, well, we need to fucking tread water for an hour so let's uh i don't know do a character study for an hour just to oh, it's, pad out the it's, time, it's painfully know? obvious it's like yo this episode doesn't matter great yeah um yeah. but i i mean i don't know i i did enjoy there were a few other, other parts of breaking bad that i think um i think I, I don't know if they've been absorbed into the um, language of television now because I don't really watch a lot of box sets and things. Um, I never got it. I hated that box set. There was a whole period of time where everybody was like, oh, you have to watch this. It's the best show ever. Do you remember wire. that whole thing? The box set whole thing? I, I never got into that. It'll be you know, the wire. I they mean, they're talking about the wire, aren't they? Yeah, the wire or whatever it <laughs> happened to be. Um, and uh, one of the things I appreciated about Breaking Bad is that um, they wouldn't, like, they did treat the audience as intelligent. It'd be like, okay, um, all of these things need to happen. We don't actually need to see them play out. So you can just do like a like a, like a a cold edit. We'll take those things as read and we'll pick up the action after that point. We don't have to laboriously watch it all. So it, it was quite good in that way. Um, it was also quite good in, like, it, it wasn't constantly stopping to hold your hand and i appreciated that um although i i I can't remember exactly how i watched it but i didn't watch it on american television and i was told that when it was shown on american tv they put these like wraparound wraparounds on it for the idiot american audience so maybe they maybe they relied on those wraparounds um what is that yeah. where it tells you what happened in the last episode or something? yeah you know the the whole like oh on last week's show you right. know right. um like I, I can't remember those elements in it when i watched it so 
I um, see. I don't need those because I usually watch. I, I never watch things when they're being released. I wait till they're finished. You know, like and then watch them in a in a row. You know, like, rather than because I can't stand waiting a week. Like <laughs> same with Nightmare, but I can't stand waiting a week for the next episode of anything. So yeah, the, the only thing I've done that with in recent memory is uh is um I did it with Line of Duty, <laughs> um which is probably the only bit of normie TV I've watched in past 10 years was that with, plus was, uh was that game of thrones i did it with game of thrones as well with line of duty like a robson and jerome thing or something no like, like line of duty was a <laughs> uh, no line of duty was this it was like a it's about um it's a really good show I, I really enjoyed it it's about um an internal police department that um called ac12 who are dedicated to um rooting out like corruption within the police it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting because um there's like a there's like a kind of pedos and the elite angle to it mm. um kind of worth a, i don't know it's kind of worth a watch uh but I, I i don't know i thought it was some pretty good television um um yeah um gorm den gamil says hey have you ever listened to alan watt not the philosopher but the conspiracy scotsman if not please do Let's see if you can think he can add something. I've never heard of Alan Watts. Have you, Horace? I've heard of the the Taoist philosopher guy. I, I don't think I don't know much about the other guy. I've heard of him, but yeah, I'm not I'm not aware of him. I'm afraid the the the, 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 the philosopher guy. He's really he's, he's he talks about the Tao. You know, like the the Tao. Like, it's interesting if you want to learn about Eastern philosophy. It's good, but yeah. Um. A Winter Phoenix Forest Corinne says, "Do a sword and sorcery, deepest law, please." Um, I, I'd have to see if um, um, Semiagog would be up for that. Um, I don't actually know if Semiagog likes sword and sorcery stuff, but if he if he if he doesn't, I would just be shocked. <laughs> I can just like you know, there's no way that guy wasn't into early 80s sword and sorcery films so <laughs> pork sword and sorcery would be a good uh, good minor genre as well as in i'm a bit bawdy there sorry all right um anything you'd like to shill uh coming up uh horace um well yeah just uh i mean if people want to i think my odyssey uh channel is linked below i'm on telegram as well i think if you search for war master horus on on telegram you'll find me but, um but yeah i haven't made any new videos for the best part of a year i am getting back into it now uh, with the one i mentioned about the european union which uh, is not particularly salient as we have left the eu but i think it, it should be an interesting like historical video and um yeah I'm, I'm planning to do a stream about bitcoin and central banking and inflation and debt and um i'm, I'm doing that i think with urban Dever, but i'm also probably gonna do a panel show after that so um I, as you're someone who's, who's versed in Austrian economics and so on, you might be interested. But I'll, I'll come back to you about that. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, um, I spoke to Radical Liberation about that and some other people, and um, you know, I, I think that this decade we're going to see a major, like, epoch-defining transformation in uh, debt and inflation. That's quite far removed from nightmare, though. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, that's uh, something I'm gradually working on. People are unhappy that I that I said Line of Duty was good. Well, I just immediately you know. thought of soldier, soldier, but it's different. Yeah, you're talking about like an in internal affairs thing, right? Do, do you know? Uh, do you know? Um, daughter of Albion, right? She mm. was very upset that I uh, that I said that the woman in Line of Duty was quite hot, um, because she's extremely butch. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see if I can find the picture of her, show you what I'm on, on about. Uh, is Daughter of Albion extremely butch as well? No, 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 da Daughter of Albion. But basically, when I show Daughter of Albion this, she said, are you gay? Um, because, <laughs> because, <laughs> because um, let me let me just show you what I'm talking about. The, the main, the main one, of, one of the main characters in that show uh, looks like this. Let me just show you uh, if I can get it up. Um, uh, have you had a look? Have you have you seen what she looks like? Um, there she no, is. you said if I can get it up, so I said ooh. Oh, oh, I see what. All right, there she is. Look, she's. Uh... <laughs> I mean, to be fair, she does look like she would be a lesbian, but you know. <laughs> oh wait, isn't she in This Is England as well? 
she is in Mrs. England. She's in like a few other things as well. Uh, well, okay, so not not butch, a bit severe, a bit severe. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I don't know. Like in in some in some scenes, she, she does get a lot butcher than others. Like, I mean, um, like there, she's, for example, she's a naturally good looking woman. But I I I think she's good looking. You know, yeah, I think she she's is good quite... looking. I mean, I don't particularly fancy her, but I appreciate. You know, I admire her. Her face uh, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a blokey haircut, I suppose, but she's not butch in any other she's not muscular or anything, is she? Like no. she's not got stubble. <laughs> <laughs> um I, 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 yeah, so there so there we go. It's always um, good not to have stubble. All right. Um so yes, um pick up uh pick up a course, uh join the channel, buy a mug. Um remember later on on AA Gold, I shared the link on my community tab. Um, I'm going to be doing a review of the Women's Hour show uh, with Red Hawk. And uh, other than that, I'll see you tomorrow night for Unpopular Opinions. Thanks for having me, AA. Really enjoyed this. Now get out.